did we not put that one in there? Uh, today is Tuesday, December 11th. We gotta get the microphone. Today is Tuesday, December 11th, and a meeting on the, of the Salem Kaiser School Board is now called to order. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? attendance for um, your knowledge everyone on the board is present tonight agenda modifications we have one this evening that we've already experienced and that's that the executive session was canceled because of a conflict of schedules we had another meeting scheduled for um, Salem Kaiser staff so we did ca cancel the executive session and we'll start our regular session right now. Our first, first thing on our agenda is spotlights on success. <clears throat> Good evening. Our first uh, spotlight tonight will be presented by Lillian Govis, our Director of Community Relations and Communications. We are so excited tonight to honor our business partner of the month for December, and that is Target at Kaiser Station. And we'd like to invite Melody Caston from the, ti the Target Kaiser Station to come forward. Is Melanie here? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll have Kaiser Elementary come <laughs> forward and accept on their behalf. <laughs> Claudia Mendoza, the school outreach coordinator at Kaiser Elementary, was recently at Target in the Kaiser Station Shopping Center. Walking down the aisle, she noticed a Target employee and asked for a manager. The employee called a manager who came over to talk to her. That Target manager was Melanie Caston, who patiently listened as Claudia explained why she was in the store. Students who don't get enough to eat at home or who miss breakfast can find it hard to pay attention and study. Claudia, Claudia was at Target to buy healthy snacks for those kids. After hearing why Claudia was shopping at Target, Melanie talked with her colleagues in Target's Human Resources Department. This led to a donation by Target of $125 in gift cards for Kaiser Elementary and an additional $500 in gift cards for the Emotional Growth Center classroom at the school, which serves students receiving special education services. Students get drowsy and they lack energy when they're hungry, but they can also become cranky, <laughs> hangry, um, and aggressive, um, says Kaiser Elementary Behavior Specialist Tara Fernandez. Um, providing these students with healthy snacks removes a barrier that prevents kids from learning. Claudia said it made Principal Christine Balby very happy when she learned about Target's generous support. Kaiser Elementary wishes to thank Melanie and the team at the Target Kaiser Station for giving the school a hand. Target went above and beyond the assistance the school was hoping for. Congratulations to Target at Kaiser Station on being recognized as our Business Partner of the Month for December 2018. All right, our next three spotlights will be presented by Sandy Price, our Director of Elementary Education. Good evening, Chair Goss, Vice Chair Blasey, Board of Directors, Superintendent Perry. Our first spotlight are our fourth grade finalists in Governor Brown's essay contest. I'd like to call it this time from Kalapuya Elementary, Caitlin Williams 
and from McKinley Elementary, Gideon Hurd, and principal from Kalapuya, Jennifer Neitzel. Oregon Governor Kate Brown asked our state's fourth grade students a question this year. What do you love about Oregon outdoors? More than 1,200 students from across the state submitted essays on the topic, hoping to win an all expenses paid trip to Washington, D.C. to light the Oregon tree at the National Christmas Tree Lighting. Fourth graders sent thousands of essays to Governor Brown with two students from Salem-Kaiser Public Schools included in a group of the nine finalists. Gideon Hurd, who attends McKinley Elementary, was one of those finalists. He shared his love of Oregon seasons. There is nowhere like Oregon and no better place to be outdoors than Oregon no matter what season of the year, wrote Gideon in his essay. Caitlin Williams from Kalapuya Elementary was the other finalist from our district. She wrote about one of her first backpacking trips with her family. Caitlin shared her excitement for the wonders of Mount Jefferson and all of the incredible landscapes Oregon has to offer. Although a Hillsboro student's essay was picked as the top essay, as finalists, Caitlin and Gideon got to read their essays to Governor Brown last week during a private meeting at the state capitol. What a thrill for our students. We are so proud of you, Caitlin and Gideon. Congratulations on being recognized as two of the top fourth grade essay writers in Oregon. Very nicely done. <clears throat> For our next spotlight, we would like to welcome the representatives from the West Kaiser Neighborhood Association and Principal Magda Romero from Cummings Elementary. The West Kaiser Neighborhood Association encompasses around 3,100 household, 3, households in Kaiser. The association's mission is to improve the quality of life for those who live, work, and play in West Kaiser. Because of all they do for the school, Principal Magda Romero at Cummings Elementary has nominated the West Kaiser Neighborhood Association as our Community Partner of the Month. About five years ago, the West Kaiser Neighborhood Association adopted Cummings, said Association <coughs> President Carol Dorfler. They began advocating for sidewalks to be constructed on Delight Street next to the school. Carol works as a substitute crossing guard at Cummings, so she has firsthand knowledge of the need for sidewalks. Another way the association supports Cummings is by helping with landscaping. Each spring, they help with the flower bed under the school's reader board and with concrete flower pots. Principal Romero says the flowers are often supplied by Egan Gardens. The association also recently spruced up the area around the foundation of the school, removing spider webs, pulling weeds, and laying bark dust. Everyone at Cummings Elementary would like to say a big thank you to the West Kaiser Neighborhood Association. Congratulations on being recognized as Salem Kaiser's Community Partner of the Month for all the support you give to your neighborhood school. Thank you so much. And our last spotlight for the evening, I would like to welcome students and staff from Four Corners Elementary School and Principal Phil Decker. Please join us up front here. And parents, and some parents from Four Corners, yes. As they make their way up, I want to ask you all a question. What does it mean to be a champion? To the Cubs at Four Corners Elementary, a champion is someone who shows courage and honor, has a positive attitude, strong motivation, and perseverance, integrity, optimism, and most of all, never gives up. 
Derived from the song Champion by Carrie Underwood, Four Corners highlights a different character trait of a champion each month in a parade of champions through the hallways while everyone <laughs> cheers and claps. Students become champions by displaying the character trait of the month, by displaying the school's behavioral expectations, or by reaching the school's goal for excellent attendance. As part of the district's Everyday 24J attendance campaign, all of our schools are working hard to address barriers to attendance. This year, Four Corners has a goal of reaching a school-wide attendance rate of 95%. Since the start of the school year, Four Corners has been trending towards that goal with record-breaking attendance. Four Corners had their first parade of champions in October with 250 students recognized for their excellent attendance. That number jumped to 430 students in November. Four Corners currently has a school-wide attendance rate of almost 95%. All grades have above 90% attendance, and fifth graders have an impressive 97% attendance rate. Four Corners counselor, Kimberly Segrist. Where are you? There she is, back there. She says students recognized as champions are succeeding despite the difficult challenges they face in life and their hard work needs to be celebrated. We are proud to celebrate the Four Corners Cubs tonight for the hard work students and their families have put into their education this school year. Congratulations. The next event for this evening is uh, public comment. This particular section of public comment is for things that are on the agenda this evening. There's one later in the agenda for public comment into things that are not on the agenda. I do want to want to let you know that if you came for a boundary discussion or something along that line, there was a conflict of interest tonight, and our specialists on the boundary are giving boundary meetings to parents around town. So if you want to talk about boundary, you're more than welcome to stay, and the board will listen. But if you have very specific questions, you might want to either wait until our next meeting, or for that matter, um, you can leave the message and we'll be happy to, to pass it on. So it's up to you. Uh, the list for tonight. First person is Bridget <coughs> Wellborn, Howard Street School in Salem. Um, for those speaking from the public tonight, um, please limit your comments to three minutes. We are using timers this evening. When the yellow light turns on, you will have 30 seconds to finish your speaking. When the red light turns on, your time is up. We have asked Paul Dacopoulos on my right to watch the time for us. Please state your name and address for the record. Remember, we have the new clock. Oh, yes, we do have the new clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be on that clock? That's a big clock there. So. <laughs> if you go over time, it will be happy to tell you. Okay, that's good, because I'm known for talking too much, so that's really good. <laughs> I have the time limit. 
Um, so my name is Bridget Wellborn. My address is 881 Ewald Avenue South in Salem, 97302. Um, I'm here to thank you for your service on the school board, but also to support um, funding for Howard Street Charter School. Both of my sons attend Howard Street. My older son is an eighth grader this year. He's been there for three years, and my younger one is the sixth grader. Um, Howard Street has been a life-changing experience for our family and for both of my children. Um, my older son experienced prejudice and some bullying at his previous school and Howard Street I feel that his differences are seen as gifts and are celebrated as opposed to something that's strange or different um, at his previous school he needed to be challenged and that was difficult with with how many different things that his teacher was having to deal with on a daily basis um, but at Howard Street he is really given those challenges that he needs is excelling has great confidence um, the 100% acceptance and diversity at Howard Street has been wonderful for him and he um, definitely feels confident and ready to take on high school and become a become an adult. <laughs> um, my, my younger son was a little bit the opposite, so I have two kids with definitely two different personalities and learning styles. And my younger one has never been fond of going to school, but at Howard Street, he can't wait to go every day. The project-based curriculum, the small class sizes have been wonderful for him and have been able to give him the, he's been able to give the time and the attention he needs to excel in school, and he can't wait to go every day, which is amazing. That's never been an experience for my children before. Um, Howard Street's a wonderful community partner also. I'm on the board of the St. Francis Homeless Shelter and we see Howard Street Charter School as one of our precious community partners that has been supporting our organization and our families for years. Um, Howard Street really, one of the things I love about it is really emphasizes community service, being a good community partner, empathy for others. Um, and really preparing kids for the real life, the way they teach um, in groups. Um, effective listening skills, positive and negative feedback. Um, look at my, it just has been, it's been a wonderful learning style for my children. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that both of my children are also hearing impaired. They're both on 504 plans and um, the accommodations that they required when they were at their previous school, they actually don't even need at Howard Street because of the learning environment in the classrooms and the smaller class sizes. They're both able to learn and hear um, better without having to have the special accommodations. Um, so I have 17, 15 seconds left, but anyways, thank you so much for your service again, and I really encourage you to support funding for Howard Street Charter School. I think it's, a, it's an amazing school um, that is an example for others. Not to say that there aren't other really amazing schools out there, too, but this is my experience with Howard Street. Thank you. Thank you. That's always nice to hear. Sarah Westfall. Hi. I'm Sarah Westfall, and my address is 3255 Crestview Drive South, also 97302. And I also am coming in on behalf of Howard Street advocating as both a teacher in the district and a parent of Howard, two Howard Street students um, requesting support and funding from the school board. For 21 years, Howard Street has had a great presence in our community and we'd like to see that continue in the coming years. And with two of my children at Howard Street, I've been able to see its great impact on their education and themselves in their personal growth. Howard Street meets the needs of many young local teens during what can be a really challenging time of teen development. And with the small class sizes, smaller school setting, um, there can be a great relationship developed between the faculty and the student body. And with the random lottery system, there's equal access to all students in the middle school age group, um, since it's random. And it makes for a really diverse, ever-changing enrollment with ethnic racial, cultural, socioeconomic, and academic diversity represented. And it's always changing because of that random lottery system. And it's a place that really celebrates diversity. I personally have two biracial children and they both feel like their, their differences are celebrated there instead of feeling like they stand out for being different in a negative way. And like Bridget said, with the hands-on project-based learning, it really gives kids an opportunity to pursue things in a way that they feel success and can challenge themselves at the same time. And it's with the well-rounded approach with STEM, humanities, and the arts, it, it really makes the children prepared for high school. 
And with the recent decrease in funding per student and the added financial hardship with the move that's coming next fall, we know that there's a reality that it, it could be in jeopardy of closing and we really don't wanna see that happen to our community because we think it's a, a good service for middle schoolers across the town. So we appreciate your consideration. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Next is Haley Herr, and Michelle Goodness will follow Haley if you'd like to come on up and get ready. Hi, my name is Haley Herr, and I'm a student at Howard Street. I'm a seventh grader, and I live on 4855 Driftwood Court Northeast. And this presentation I'm giving today is not only about saving our school, but also saving many educations for children at this school. Um, as you already know, Howard Street has a high chance of closing, and if that did happen, it would be very devastating to our community and most of the parents and children that go to the school now. Um, this school has given me a various um, amounts of opportunities, um, such as I've gained a better understanding in most of my classes, and as I struggled a lot in, uh, in my other schools and different, uh, like I didn't learn as much, but once I came here, it helped me grow as a learner. If you were to ask me what my favorite part of this school was, I would most likely say the uh, zero bullying tolerancy. Um, as you also might know, we are a music and arts school, but that gives us the title of a school that only does music and arts, which is totally wrong, because we have three categories, which shows Ellington, Einstein, and Esperanza. Um, Einstein shows technology, science, math, also known as STEM. Then there's our other category, Ellington. It shows the visual arts, dance, drama, graphic design, and music. Then last but not least, Esperanza. This category shows world history, social studies, language arts, and Spanish. Our school also does, does tons of community service work. We do rake and runs for our neighbors, and then we do the food drive for St. Francis, along with other service projects all throughout Salem. We do this so we are giving something to our community. We are not just a school, we are a family. So please help, my, help give my family, my friends, and teachers' family hope. I urge you to pass this resolution so that many, many, many more generations will be able to go to a wonderful school and experience wonderful education that is Howard Street. Thank you. Also, thank you for serving on our board, our representatives, and for the Sam Kaiser School uh, District. Thank you, Ahaley. <laughs> Kaylee, I want to compliment you on your presentation. It was excellent. You did a nice job. Uh, Michelle? My name is Michelle Goodness. I live at 2764 12th Street Southeast in Salem, 97302. Um, I have taught at Howard Street for two and a half years. I also have the unique perspective of having taught in several other Salem-Kaiser schools before this. Here's what I know based on my teaching experiences over the past nine years. We have exceptional schools in the Salem-Kaiser School District. Our teachers and other staff members work incredibly hard to connect with kids in meaningful ways and to help them succeed academically. Howard Street is no exception. While Howard Street is a school that is unique in its size, in its vision, and in its community, it is also a school that is striving for all of the same outcomes as every other school in our district. We want high graduation rates. We want all students to prevail. We also want to challenge these <coughs> young people to work harder than they think they can. And we see a future where every child knows how important they are. This is a common mission. We share it with each and every one of you. What our school is asking is to continue to be able to share that mission with the Salem-Kaiser School District. To that end, let me talk briefly about one of the goals that we strive for at Howard Street. Part of our unique mission is to encourage middle school students to strive towards creative, out-of-the-box thinking. I'd like each of you to put on that hat for a moment in thinking about our current situation. Our financial situation is unique in the history of this district. We fully understand the limitations of what we are asking, as well as the need for equity, but we are not asking for more than any other school, nor are we asking for something inequitable, an unfair advantage. We are simply asking for something different, 
but not because we are different, simply because we are in a unique situation that is quite simply out of our control. South needs our space. We know this, we understand this. This is the reason why our principal and our board have worked tirelessly, have spent countless hours coming up with creative solutions and working to ensure that this school, a school that has been part of the Salem community and has shared a vision with the Salem-Kaiser School District for more than 20 years, continues on for many years to come. Yes, we are asking for something different than what has been done, but we certainly are not asking for something unreasonable. One last thing. Before you make your decision tonight, I hope that you will not only think about the budgetary decision that you are making. I hope you will also think about the statement that you are making to the students of Howard Street, the 180 kids who are part of the Salem-Kaiser community. Thank you for your time and all that you, each of you do for our students and our community. I hope you will do us the honor of making a decision tonight, which will allow us to remain part of this incredible district for a long time to come. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> Thank, <good>. you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. Next is Neaton Joshi. I might have said that wrong. No, it was fairly okay. It's uh, Nitin Joshi. Thank you. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, I reside at 1597 Webster Drive, Southeast. And uh, good evening, uh, all of you members of the board. Uh, I'm here today uh, as uh, a parent of one of the students in Howard Street Middle School, and uh, who's an eighth grader, uh, Mihir Joshi. And I'm here to talk in support of uh, item 6C on your agenda tonight. Specifically, uh, basically, I'm here to alleviate any concern that you might have regarding the inclusive nature uh, or the diversity at Howard Street Middle School. Um, not long ago, me and my family were over here, uh, right in front of you. And basically, you were honoring my son uh, for uh, and his friend for representing the school district to uh, go to the nation's capital and basically be a finalist for a STEM-based uh, um, STEM based competition for middle schoolers. And I'm glad to report that basically they came out with uh, winning that competition with a significant amount of awards. Uh, both of them did very well. So I just want to let you know that uh, not only did they do this, their school proud, but also the school district. So uh, definitely put us much more on the map right there. Um, all that actually, I can tell you, does not take place without a huge amount of support, not only from the school teachers, but also from the principals of the schools. So I just want to make sure that you realize and recognize the hard work that uh, goes into basically giving those kind of opportunities and definitely uh, seeing that how uh, to continue the support that students need uh, for such end endeavors. And basically, uh, never has my child come back, come from school uh, and told me that uh, he did not have an equal opportunity as anybody else in the school or uh, that he was not being treated pro properly or appropriately uh, at the school, either by the students or staff or anyone. In fact, I would say the values that uh, the school embodies in their EMBER program, basically the excellence, mindfulness, being creative, empathy, and uh, responsible risks uh, has proved uh, provided besides proficiency uh, the Howard Street uh, that is it's really worth emulating it's really something that you uh, should probably uh, propagate to other schools as well so with uh, in conclusion I would like to recommend that the board support Howard Street request without any hesitation and I would say there are more avenues for you know this kind of successful school to continue to thrive in this community that we should be seeking. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Our next uh, speaker will be Zoe Drakon. Uh oh, I said it wrong, no. And following uh, Zoe will be Mindy Merritt. Good evening. Mostly I'm here to, to say thank you. And my name is Zoe Diaku, and I live in Sharan's district in Southeast Salem. And I would like to thank each and every one of you 
for your work as school board members and particularly for not trying to avoid conflict. And I want to thank you for not rubber stamping proposals. Thank you for thoughtfully listening to members of our community. Thank you for listening to those who um, talk about how wonderful the Howard Street program is, which it truly is. It's a program I, I love. But thank you for also listening to those who are concerned about conversations that should have taken place long before now um, about equity um, and the fact that they do not serve the number of non-white students that most of our other schools do. And thank you for those listening to those who are expressing concern about the lack of accessibility of our district website or the lack of accessibility and communication about our boundary meetings. And thank you for recognizing that many members of the community deem it highly questionable <coughs> to offer early renewal and a bonus to our superintendent when we say that we have a budget shortfall. Again, thank you for your work on this board. Thank you very much for coming. It's appreciated. Good evening. My name is Mindy Merritt and I reside in Salem Kaiser. As an association, SKEA values the opportunities that Howard Street Charter School provides to its 180 students that it is able to serve each year. It is important to understand that Howard Street is in a unique situation. They are a charter school that doesn't have the same rules as the other charters in Salem because of their existence before the charter school laws of the late 1990s. This proposal before you tonight, which I note doesn't come with a recommendation from district leadership, unlike most items that come to the board, will continue to set Howard Street apart from other schools. Already at Howard Street, most of the staff are employees of Howard Street and not the district. This means their working conditions, wage benefits, <coughs> etc., are not controlled by you as the school board. Already at Howard Street, they have preferential practices for certain students to be automatically accepted if they apply for admission. Already at Howard Street, they get the same funding as JGEMS, another middle school charter that is not in a district-owned facility. There is a problem with resources in this district. There aren't enough. Our members and most employees saw heard and read a message from Superintendent Perry and from district leadership from the start of the year that there isn't enough money to support all the things that we know are best practices. Interventions that we know our students need. IA adult assistance support time that our classrooms require that are now in need growing class sizes because we can't hire more teachers and we don't have the funding necessary for the students that have special needs and the students that have social emotional needs that right now are in need and are going without. Is providing this charter school with more resources to support the up to 180 students at this school the most equitable thing to do? One of the arguments in this proposal is that Howard Street doesn't have the access to a public bond process the same way that the district at large does. So the proposed solution is to use general fund dollars to pass through Howard Street and pay for their bond. The public decided on the bond for the district to include being used to see what the proposal was for. Where is the public input for this bond that the district would be funding with the public dollars? Furthermore, the pub building would not be owned by the district, but the district would help to fund its renovation. As Thank the association you, president, I stand before the school board calling upon you to use consider 
to consider the expenses that lie ahead and the needs of not just the 180 students, but the needs of our 42,000 students who attend our Salem-Kaiser School District, our public schools, not our private schools, that we are responsible for providing the same amazing and equitable quality school experience Mindy, that these individuals are sharing about Howard Street School students to all of our students. Thank you. Mindy, Mindy yes. I notice on the sign-in sheet you did not mention what organization you're representing. Would you do that? Absolutely. I am the uh, <coughs> president of the Association for SKEA, which I stated in my first line, Association of SKEA. Thank you. Uh, Shannon Johns. Hi, I uh, too want to join in the thanks for taking your time and your energy to be on the board. And I come to you in support of the Howard Street proposal. My daughter picked up, a, picked up a book on her own and read the other day. She's never done that. And as an avid reader who wished to share that with my oldest child, <coughs> that was a moment that came because of what she was doing and the education she's receiving at Howard Street. Because she has been able to go and see the world, not just as, hey, I'm in math class and I'm going to solve an equation, or I'm in science class and I'm going to learn about how the life cycle of a tree, or that's my kindergartner, <laughs> um, but what's going on in science class or in a social studies class, but being able to see across the curriculum what that brings to her and how she has changed her worldview. She picked up a book because she had an interest in it and wanted to learn more. And she has never done that prior to being at Howard Street. And that has an impact on our family and the example that she sets for our younger children and the inquiry that she has developed because of what she's learned at Howard Street. In addition, when changes were made at Howard Street and the dollars were lowered, that was with the understanding that they would be in a district facility. And moving them out, they are no longer there. And so it is, I would ask that you would consider that fact as you look at that rec resolution this, uh, this evening. My child is, I know, one of 180 kids who won the lottery to be able to go there, and that's how we look at it in our family. But it was open to everyone to put their name in, and there is equity in that. It's not handpicking students. It is truly saying everyone can put their name in and has the same, depending on number of people who put their name in, the same percentage of being drawn out of that lottery hat. And so I would encourage you to take um, a sincere look at the recommendation that's being brought before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. A little change in topic here. We have Anna Zorn next. Hi there. I'm Anna, and I have three children. Um, we are currently at the Candelaria Elementary School. I live on Jana Avenue um, near Nelson Park. We are in a, neighbor, a very small neighborhood that is currently um, proposed to be separated from the Candelaria Elementary School and put um, into Salem Heights Elementary School and then Crossler and Sprague rather than um, the original school system that we're in. So we were not included in these changes on the first three task force proposals. So we just learned about this last week at the information session. Um, this is devastating news to many of us. Um, like I said, I live in a very small um, neighborhood and um, we, the, the place that we chose to live and raise our family was largely based on the schools that we would be going to. We um, had the, 
the opportunity to, to make those choices, and we did, and I do believe that many others in my small neighborhood um, made decisions based on those same factors, um, as well as community relationships. The Candelaria community is a very small one, um, and it is questionable whether the um, changes would have a significant impact. We're talking single digit numbers over the next couple of years, and yet this is a huge change um, that would affect a very small, close knit community. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to just um, reach out to you and um, ask you to consider is that there are many affected families that are unaware of these proposals. Um, you know, I look around at the neighborhood that I'm in, the young family, that their kids aren't even in school yet, so they, this is not on their radar, but they, they moved there with this in mind. Um, I do believe that we need to spend more time getting feedback from others, um, considering how this affects very well-established, close-knit neighborhoods, um, and I just beg you to um, reconsider making this decision so soon. I understand that a decision is supposed to be made mid-January. Um, like I said, we just found out about this um, last week, and we have a group that is spread across PTA task force and here tonight um, just trying to gather as much information as we can and help be a part of the process. Um, to, to be involved in a decision that would be best for everyone. So um, I, I do thank you for your time and your service, and um, I would love to help in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening is Chris Sturgis. 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 Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> So I am a data scientist, not a public speaker, so have grace for me. <laughs> um, my name is Chris Sturgis. I live at uh, 2176 Heath Street South. I've lived in Salem for about 15 years. I think Salem is the best kept secret of the valley. I've lived in Portland before this. Um, we are so happy to be here. Um, so last week, my community was informed that the task force uh, has redistricted our community school of Candelaria, which was previously unaffected uh, in the previous meetings. Anna Zorn is my neighbor. I coach her kids in soccer. We are a tight-knit community. Um, my soccer team that I coach, the Attack Owls, <laughs> they are famous at Candelaria School. That team will be divided by this change. I've never actually played soccer in my life, but our team does very well. Um, tonight marks several important events. First, it marks one week since we were given notice of this important change. Um, the task force is meeting tonight to finalize the recommendation to this board. The Candelaria PTA is meeting to discuss this tonight as well. And then, of course, this meeting here. The community is divided among these forums to make sure that our voices are heard. I have a few of our concerns, but by no means this covers all of them. It's just a few. Um, there's no safe walking uh, path from our neighborhood to Salem Heights, which is where our kids would go. Um, as a data scientist, I have looked at the numbers. There are very few kids impacted by this in terms of the volume going to the school. In 2022, we will have six more kids than we do now, just six. Um, Anna and I both talked about our community. We've already covered that. Um, it also does not improve the diversity of Crossler or Sprague. So thank you. And go attack owls. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure you're a wonderful coach. <laughs> and attack owls react to that. <laughs> Moving on, our next session is action items for this evening. Does anyone wish to pull an item? Oh, at the end. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, we will now hear comments. The section. Uh, public comment. 
Already heard. That makes better sense. I apologize. Our first action item is regarding the OSBA resolution to amend OSBA's bylaws relating to the composition of its board of directors. We had a first reading on this item in November on the 11th at a board meeting. Is Is there a motion to approve OSBA's resolution to amend bylaws? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any d further discussion? Madam Chair, yes. I need to declare a conflict of interest. I won't be able to take part in this vote. OSBA is my employer, and this creates the bosses for me at my employment. Okay. Uh, the resolution has a motion before us there has been a second and is there any more discussion we will call for a vote all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Uh, all opposed seeing none we pass this motion with one abstention with one abstention thank you mr green Our next item is the OSBA legislative policies and priorities. Our second item is also in regards to Oregon School Board <coughs> Association. This the time to approve the OSB resolution to adopt its 2019-2020 legislative priorities and policies. We also had a first reading on this item at our November 11th board meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So o moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. The motion has been approved by Director Kylo, and it has been seconded by Director Lippold. We'll call for a vote. All in favor? Madam Chair, again, I uh, need to declare a conflict on this, and I'll be abstaining from the vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We will call for a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passed. <coughs> can I comment on that? You sure can. Okay. Um, I'm on the, I serve on the Legislative Policy Committee for OSBA, and I just want to say um, there's a lot of hours and hours put into this. Um, some of the big things we were looking for was um, making sure that there weren't any uh, keeping the state financially responsible, so make sure they're not putting mandates on us that aren't funded, of course. Um, and then, of course, increasing school funding, making sure we can fund our kiddos. So that's all. Thank you, Director Lippold. Any more comments or discussion? Thank you. We'll move on to the next action item. And the next one is the approval of the Howard Street there it is, the Howard Street Charter School. And I'm going to interject a comment before we start. And I, we've noticed this, I've discussed it with the rest of the leadership team, that the way this is set up, parents come in and make a comment, and in the next section we vote. And that always seems to me very harsh. People don't realize that the board members have read about the issue and I want to assure all parents that come that whatever you have to say is considered. So it almost thing, seems like we've made up our mind ahead of time, you come and we ignore what you have to say. I want to assure you that that isn't the truth, that the parents that come and speak have every possibility of pushing our vote one way or another. Now let's start. All right, um, this <coughs> next action item is the appro to approve or not approve the funding modification for Howard Street Charter School Agreement. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Principal Tracy, and she has a couple additional um, bits of information she wants to provide uh, the board. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Board and Superintendent Perry. I want to speak just for a couple moments. Um, I spoke to you last time, so I believe that my comments are very similar, but this time I want to focus on one issue that was brought to our attention for more detail, which is the issue of diversity in Howard Street Charter School. And I want to speak to that in a number of um, 
mechanisms. One, I have some data up there for you that was supplied by Salem Kaiser. And I do want us to note that it's true that our ethnic and racial diversity does not match all of the entire district. For example, students who speak Spanish as a first language do not attend Howard Street like other schools in the district. I understand this as our Spanish program is intended for beginners and there are other opportunities at Parish and later at North that have a strong dual immersion language program that can meet better, their needs better than our school. Diversity is a very complex issue and our community including Howard Street needs to keep addressing this so that all students can be successful. It asks our families and our community to communicate their identity in check boxes which can sometimes be difficult to do. For me, it shows a 45-year-old married white woman that grew up in Tumalo, Oregon, who has been teaching in Salem-Kaiser for 22 years and has been principal of Howard Street for six. But these boxes miss many of the complexities and nuances that I use as part of my identity. It misses that my 93-year-old grandmother, who lives currently in Bend, is a first-generation immigrant, that she refused to teach my father her first language of Spanish because she did not want her sons to be treated differently. But it was okay for the granddaughters because it was novelty by then. It doesn't miss, the those boxes also miss that I grew up in a small community where my father worked in the local mill that is now a shopping mall in uh, Bend, Oregon, and that we lived day to day, paycheck to paycheck, but never went for free and reduced lunch because my parents thought it was their responsibility to make sure I had a meal every day at school. The boxes miss that I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. I'm the first person in my family to have a master's degree and that my sister passed me up with a PhD. So I have 50 years to catch her in my mind. The boxes miss that I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 32 years old and that I'm a 13 year survivor who takes that idea with me every day into the classroom. I bring all this up about me because I think Howard Street has a diversity that is sometimes difficult to catch in boxes. The geographic diversity of our group is also something that we presented to the board that shows 10 year of data of the applicants who have applied to our school is geographically very rich. It misses that students from alternative backgrounds like online, homeschool, or private school are returning to Salem-Kaiser Public Schools through Howard Street and going on to our local high schools. It misses that my sixth grade STEM teacher is leading a student-led conference in Mandarin Chinese, a language she doesn't speak, because that is what is needed for our families. That the sign language interpreters are at our drama productions so that our parents in the deaf community can participate as well that students in the LGBTQ community have found a safe environment in our inclusive school. The boxes miss that students with medical needs and who have parents thank us for our smaller environment where they feel that their children are safe. It misses that one of our top college degrees is social work, which I'm really proud about because the idea of serving our community goes with them into high school and beyond. I could go on, but my point is, is that Howard Street is diverse in ways that are sometimes difficult to catch in traditional statistics. I hope you will take this into account and notice that diversity comes in many forms as you make your decision today. Part of that has to do with fiscal equality as well, and so I want to introduce our treasurer, Eric Davis, for a couple comments. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time and I really appreciate Superintendent Perry and Mike Wolf's um, direction over the last month or so in being able to redirect and articulate our needs in a more succinct manner so it would be <laughs> easier for the board to digest. Um, you know, looking at this from the standpoint of um, what we need to do financially is really what our finance committees looked at. Um, we've gone through um, multiple gyrations of how we evaluate, how we can afford things, um, ultimately leading us to OFA um, and um, finding opportunity to get to money at a lesser cost than we could through typical <coughs> financing and for longer terms as part of the way in which we were trying to look at this. Um, from a from a property standpoint, we looked at multiple properties actually going back before the last charter um, because we've been under the understanding that this day could happen 
for quite some time. And um, through that time period, we've looked at properties all over the city, south, northeast, downtown, in multiple options. And um, from what we've looked at, I can tell you that the cost opportunity associated with the existing location is as good or better than any other of the opportunities w that we've looked at. The primary issue for us, of course, is the uh, seismic and the cost associated with updating a location in order to meet the seismic needs of a school um, occupancy. So um, with that in mind, the other drive as to why we've wanted to move downtown is because historically Howard Street's been looked at as a South High, South Salem school. And um, we have endeavored to move away from that over the last decade plus, and we want to continue to do that. Um, that means by moving downtown, our goal is to springboard that into creating more opportunities for more students um, to have an opportunity to go to school there. Um, from an equity standpoint, I think that's what um, part of what our discussions were earlier, um, that equity was part of the issue, diversity was part of the issue, um, but we wanted to look at it from the standpoint of what is equality and what is equity. And, and from that standpoint, we're looking at equality with um, the, 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 the issue on the left. And you can see that with equality, our little guy in the third box really isn't benefiting too much. With equity, we're able to put our resources where our needs are. And, and that was really the intent of our message within our proposal to the school. Um, we're in this position, um, school district's in this position, not because we want to be. <laughs> it's something that um, we're hoping that we can make this into as short a term solution as possible for this district relocation transition contribution. Um, and we want to work as partners to make sure that we're able to um, find other revenue streams to be able to support the um, ongoing future um, options for us. So that's, that's really what, why we're here. And thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we're open to questions. And I just want to make a comment. I have 20 more years till I retire. And I plan to be at Howard Street. So I hope the proposal goes through this evening. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Perry. Before we vote on this motion, or the motion that's to come, we'll have a brief update on the funding modification request from you. Yeah, I think um, you have it in your board packet, and it um, is uh, clearly outlined that they would like it to be a uh, relocation uh, contribution and a not to exceed amount. The first terms of the contract, they're asking for it uh, not to exceed that, for that additional 15% uh, ADMW, and I, what I want you to think about is if you do make a motion to approve, I w it would be best if the motion could include a recommendation to negotiate uh, the contract, because I think there are some provisions that uh, would be important uh, to the board and to the district um, that we would want to be sure that both uh, legal counsels had had a chance to look at. We have not had legal counsel weigh in on a uh, actually amendment to their contract at all and I think that's uh, would be important in the process so I'll open it up to questions before we take a motion especially while they're um, at the podium director green thank you madam chair I I had some questions Mindy's testimony the SKEA president um, indicated that there were preferential admissions treatments for students. And I was reading the contract that we have between you and us, and there aren't 
any preferences except for siblings or if they attended the school previously is that correct that is correct except Very. I also notice on your website you give preference to staff members students and that's in violation of the law you do not have a waiver to do that so please tell me you're not doing that we had a recommendation from ODE we contacted them and there is language in our admissions that meets the ODE standards I also contacted <laughs> ODE and they indicated that you do not have a waiver from ORS chapter 338 to have that occur and we have not had that occur at this point yes uh, I guess another question is in your uh, facility relocation project you've talked about some work that you've done with AC and co architects and Rich Dunn construction Richard Duncan construction you've done that under public contracting law is that correct yes so we went through an RFP process last uh, school year uh, we opened it up and had interviews as well last spring so I guess a question then would be where did you receive the funds in order to have that work done we currently have reserves that we have been using to have that particular uh, component we've been saving our pennies over the last 20 years and I guess then my follow-up question is what's your current reserves our current reserves as of November and Pablo correct me if I'm wrong was 600,000 correct Are there other questions? Yeah. Thank you. And um, first of all, thank you for providing additional information. I know that I've been asking a lot of questions about equity, and I still have questions because I think despite uh, the visual that you displayed, I still have concerns about the difference between access, equal access and equity mm -hmm. for your population. And I don't want to confuse that with the funding request, but because this does keep coming up, and and I appreciate you answering the questions. Um, I guess two years ago we had a conversation about um, the process you go through to try to encourage families of color or uh, more diverse families, student population, to to apply. So yes, it's a lottery system, but people actually have to go to the website and they have to sign up. And I guess I was really surprised to see that um, you know, the, the families of color have not increased, instead they've decreased. And I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. So I, I guess I'm a little troubled by comments that, um, so the question I have is what are, you, what are you doing and to try to encourage families of color and um, and those of a, a different economic background. And I guess part of that question too is I, I saw the scatter plot of where families live, but I still don't have information about uh, f you know, the free and reduced lunch save families or um, you know, the economic means of the families. And that's what I've been asking about. And so I, I still have those outstanding questions. Sure, and I greatly appreciate the questions because it makes us think as well, and I am thankful for that. Um, I wanted to show you the scatter plot ge geographically because one question that we do not collect demographic information on our applicants. It is a completely blind lottery, so we do not ask anything except for address and a couple questions in order to ease access. And the answers to those don't even have to be in English, so it just has to be an application. It does not have to be from the website. We also send out flyers to all of our elementary schools, for example, and, and the counselors there as well to try and broaden the um, base. Our understanding was that in order to have a fair and equitable lottery as required by Oregon State, we did not want to target any specific groups of people. We want it open to everybody. So we're trying to walk that fine balance between open and, and trying to draw people into our lottery system as well. We do have um, tried to remove every barrier that we can for people to apply and that includes uh, minimizing our application to not a lengthy process so that everybody can apply. I agree with you that it's a lottery and it's a constantly changing system. I know this is hard to believe, but we are more diverse now than when we started as a South Salem feeder school. And a lot of the schools that we draw heavily from, Candelaria, McKinley, and Salem Heights, are not as diverse as our other elementary schools as well. Um, we do not go to individual P2 
CTC meetings of any kind of any of the schools. So we are certainly looking at that. Um, when we were coming up for recharter, um, we looked at there's a new weighted lottery option in uh, Oregon under the charter school law. Um, we found out that was very complex and it was not there is no guidelines from ODE at this time on how to even implement that. So we are certainly looking at that, but it's also one of the reasons that I really wanted to move downtown. And I think that's going to open access to a new community with Grant community neighborhood being nearby and us being closer to Parish and North than our current community. I agree that we have had the option when we were started before the Oregon Charter School Law that we created a certain culture that we have been chipping away out over time to become more and more diverse. Just the irony to that is um, some of the foundations where you can get the most significant amount of money for, we don't qualify for today because of our lack of diversity. So it is absolutely a motivation of ours to be able to continue to create diversity for those types of funding options as well. Director Hyatt. <clears throat> so it's not really a question for you so much as kind of a statement. As a former charter school mother of a JGEMP student, my minority child won both Howard Street and JGEMP's lotteries. And I know it's totally random unless you have a sibling there already. Um, I, th I think what could be done, and it's not really maybe so much you guys, but the rest of the district, is to make sure that all parents know about the opportunity, maybe starting even in fourth grade, because information doesn't always make it home. Parents don't always know what the particular opportunities bring, you know, what, what special things you can do at J-Jumps and, and Howard Street that you may not do at a regular school. And so if we start maybe in fourth grade and then again early in fifth grade, so parents are totally aware of this option to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, there's always going to be the problem of transportation. Um, our first year was at Waldo, which was in walking distance from my home. That's why they got picked over Howard Street, <laughs> where I'd have to drive. Uh, but then they lost their spot in Waldo and had to go, they went to the deaf school. So we had transportation issues. But you know, you can carpool and make things work if you really want to. And, um, and, and if you can't, then maybe that's not the right option for your family. You know, every kid has different needs and uh, learns differently. So I, I think we could do better by making sure the parents know about the opportunity and maybe then you would get a more diverse population. Uh, Director Lipol. Sure. Uh, looking at your, uh, your scatter plot 1B, which shows, is, which shows your students currently enrolled in Howard Street, mm -hmm. um, it looks, I mean, of course, significantly as if these students are all in South Salem because they are. Um, I mean, which makes sense because your location is there. That's where you guys, you guys' building is. Um, and, and 12 of those were siblings. Oh, so, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> That's a lot of siblings. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you move downtown, because uh, you guys are going to be moving, so, I mean, of course, your location is going to be different. What is your plan to get that community, your new community, um, to know about Howard Street and um, to take a look at it? One thing that we're looking forward to is com continuing our community events in a new community. So for example, the rake and run, I don't know if you've heard about that, but we uh, go out and tend to our neighborhood. We rake their leaves for free and just walk around the community um, volunteering our services to assist. We hope to do that in the Grant community neighborhood, which will be a new neighborhood for us. We also want to have community partnerships in the downtown area. For example, we will not have a gymnasium, so we've already reached out to some of the local churches nearby who have an auditorium in order to build some of those community connections. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I am a former Spanish teacher in addition to my current <coughs> humanities uh, assignment that I do. I would love for our kids to go read at Grant as a, as a neighborhood opportunity for our students and for the Grant students as well. So I believe there are connections that can be made in our new space. We just have to get there first. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more? I have one follow-up question because it keeps coming up. Sorry. So I'm going to ask about it. Regarding transportation, mm -hmm. I know in your um, packet of information you said that it's on the bus line. So what is the plan for middle schoolers riding the city bus to and from school? 
So some of our students ride the city bus to South okay. Salem as it how is now. They, mm -hmm. How do they do that? Are they, they're, they're taken to the bus stop or? So our parent club helps uh, with some of the transportation. So we do a lot of carpooling, but we also believe we're gonna be in walking distance of a number of locations as well, like we are now, different locations. But uh, some of our eighth graders do use the city bus system more than say our sixth graders. But yes, we will, we will assist them with that like we do now. So we have a few families who, not this year, but in the past have lived in areas that had transportation difficulties. So we assisted them with bus passes to make sure that they could get to school. Thank you. Director Hyatt. So I'm just getting all this stuff. I have all these notes I made while everybody was talking. <laughs> we will get through all of them eventually. So uh, one concern I had, uh, of course, the other charter schools did not buy property. And my concern then is being liable as a school district should you default when whatever term of this grant is, relocation grant. Uh, wanting to make sure that we are not liable because future school districts or school boards may say no and, and may revert you back to 85 percent mm -hmm. you know how how will that be in the contract or whatever to keep the district from being liable should you default you want to talk to that or you want me to I can. Okay. Um, I think part of that is going to be based upon the agreement we have with the church um, the church has um, stepped up to be partners with us through that process um, and what I mean by that is that um, they, their lease um, of the surrounding um, real estate that the building sits on um, within our lease agreement it defines that it always has to be a school so they've been very supportive of how we go about doing that as, as far as the OFA financing is concerned um, I, I do not see risk to the district through the default um, this is between Howard Street Charter School and the um, funding that comes through that OFA process and the bonds. Um, the, sc the school district is not part of that agreement. Okay. And we will be the third school charter school in Oregon to do the OFA financing. So this process has also occurred in Redmond Proficiency Academy as well as um, Arco Iris in Portland. Are there any other comments or questions? Just one other, just one other thing there. Because we are a charter school, we are sponsored by you, and we are not part of the district, so it's even another separation. So, so that I look at as a protection to the district as well. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Is there a motion to approve the funding modification to the Howard Street Charter School? A question, a point of order. I just raise a question. Okay. I'm sorry that I, I missed it, but I thought usually after public comment is done, you ask if there's anyone else who would like to make public comment. I'm I, sorry. I thought this was public, additional public comment. So I wondered if you, if I could have the opportunity or not to make. Yes, you can. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Crystal. I'm a, a community member. I live just a walking distance from Howard School. And I hadn't intended to talk about anything tonight until I heard the comments, heard the discussion about Howard School. And I have to say, I'm, my focus is the equity lens. And you have an equity lens here. And I, I, when you have engaged parents, you're going to have kids that are engaged. And that's great. That's what Howard School does well. And my, my daughters were raised in the other public schools within the system here. And so, some of the same touching stories exist throughout other schools within the system. Also, when we look at diversity and equity, sure, you know, I grew up in a 100% white school district. We had diversity and economic diversity. We had lots of other diversity, but we didn't have racial and ethnic diversity. And with you, through your equity lens, you're really trying to struggle with the fact, I know, with the fact that this district is over 52% students of color. The, you're struggling to try to have the faculty match that, and it, what it takes is not just, well, we have applications open to anybody. What it takes is recruitment. It takes intentional work to go out and recruit. Howard Street's been here for 20 years. I was surprised. I, it, I live near it, so I should have not been surprised. 20 years and have not even made much of a step in that direction. 81% white students. Sure, there's diversity among those white students, but I guarantee you there's similar diversity among black students, among, among Latinx students, among Marshallese students. You can't just say, 
we're open. Our process is open. You've got to make an intentional effort to reach out to communities of color, to underserved communities, and, and invite people in and engage people to bring them into this process. So I'm concerned, and we, what we don't have here is we don't have any data on the faculty and administration, and we pepper you on that when it comes to, to the public schools within the system. What's, what are you doing to increase, increase the diversity of faculty and administration dealing with students? I don't see any of that here. Well, it seems to me if you, if you approve this charter, you've got a lot that you've got to do to require some standards be put in place to show that 20 years of lack of action on this, of lack of success in having a diverse student body that reflects the students and the parents in this city, uh, that's a problem. And it, you know, looking at this, it raises all kinds of questions in my mind that it seems to me you're not ready to approve this. Director Hyen. So I just have a, one more question. So the employees at Howard Street are not technically, except for one and a half FTE, they are not technically mm -hmm. district employees. Is that correct? Do uh, I have that correct? Or yeah, that is correct. I'm not sure if you have the right amount of FTE, but there is uh, mostly Howard Street Charter School employees that they pay. And then we have um, a one and a half Fish, um, Salem Kaiser Public Schools employees that um, are we pay yet they reimburse us for so it's not a cost to us but they are our employees. So, but the, the most of them are actual Howard Street employees, not our employees. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? We're going to take comments after we vote or after you call for the vote. I'll call for a vote and then comment. Um, so is there a motion? I was going to make a motion. Okay. Marty's going to make a motion. I'll make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the relocation grant and the contract. I may not be saying this right, so you guys can help me. With additional negotiation as required to make sure that we are kept out of the liability issue and everything. So, oh, are those the right words or not? <laughs> I think the, I mean, the motion would be subject to... I want to you to look at it, Paul, sub, and make sure. Subject to um, uh, a contract that's uh, in a form that's acceptable to, to the district uh, to account for the legal issues that, uh, that this presents. Okay, what he said. <laughs> that's my motion. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, considering that. Mr. Dacopoulos' motion, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Director Lippold. All those in no, favor? No, 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 discussion. 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 Now you have to discuss this again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I will be the first contributing discussion. And mm -hmm. I, I tend to think that part of the diversity question will be answered by the change in location. And I did hear from their principal, actually, that they were going to make effort in that direction. Uh, you did make the comment that um, you had primarily schools that fed you that were right around you in that location. And a number of those schools are primarily white schools or higher income schools. And I think this will help. And I think that you have mentioned that you will make the effort to do that. That and transportation will be solved to a degree downtown. Other comments? I just wanted to say again that I think the equity can be achieved more so than it is now by making sure we reach out to fourth grade parents across the district and then again <coughs> in the early fifth grade before long before deadlines so, uh, for both for all the charters so they can uh, make sure to think about it and get their applications in and because this is on a bus line one big problem for not just for, for pretty much any parent is transportation. So having it on a bus line I see as a positive where more kids have an opportunity when it's downtown than they do right now. And I can understand where more people would apply in the South Salem area just because it's easier for those parents to, to drop their kids off at school. 
Director Leipold? Well, I'm not going to lie. It's a pretty tough decision to make. Um, I went into this, after, especially after the, after the last presentation thing, man, there's no way I'm going to approve this. There's no way I'm going to say yes. Partially because, um, one, we're, this district itself, we don't have a ton of cash, right? I mean, that's, let's just be perfectly honest with ourselves when we say that. Um, it's not like we have a ton of funding available. Um, and especially when we're giving a bit large amount of funding to 180 students. It, it, at first glance, you're like, there's no way. Uh, it also appears as if Howard Street had a plan A and no plan B. This was their Hail, Hail Mary and re are relying on us to approve this, um, which if it was a business plan and you were on Shark Tank, they would tell you no just because of that. I mean, it's a business strategy. Um, however, I do realize a lot of, the, a lot of the, the restrictions you guys have. You guys can't raise money through a vote like we can and things like that. So I, I completely understand that. Um, I'm just trying to tell you the thoughts that honestly came through. Um, and another thing is when, you look at, when you're looking at the data, it looks like it's just a bunch of white kids going to school, if you're going to be perfectly frank about it. Um, even though, I mean, of course it's not completely, but at first glance, if we're being perfectly honest, that's what it would look like from someone who just doesn't know anything about how it's straight. Um, however, I also understand the location is going to help equi equity immensely. And since you have said that you were going to make a big change, I, I believe you when you say that. And when, when, and if I say yes to this, it's going to be me putting trust in you um, to do what you say you are going to do, which is improve the equity and diversity of Howard Street. Um, I mean, when you do this, just like how when we raise public money from the public, I mean, we're essentially, would, if we say yes, we're giving you public money, which is taxpayers' dollars. And when we did that through our bond, right, the public watches us to make sure we are using things uh, correctly. And we are being wise, and we are being equitable, and we are being diverse with the money we spend. And that's something that I would say the public would expect of you guys as well. And so I just want, even though I'm sure you already know this, I just feel like it should be said. Um, I do believe that Howard Street has done a lot of excellent work with the students that they do have in teaching these students how to be successful. And even though it's 180 students, sometimes it takes just one student to be hugely successful to make an impact in the entire community. I will be voting yes, and with this vote, I would like to let you know that the community is going to be watching. We're going to be making sure that things are done well and things are done correctly. Um, and also show that after this assistance, this assistance that you can run yourself, just basically make sure we're not making a financial mistake um, by funding Howard Street, um, which kind of comes with it. And also, please prove that I'm making the correct decision by um, being equitable and by diverse, by reaching out to your new neighbors, and by making sure that the students of your new community and of our entire community have access and that you're doing the best that you can to educate students. Thank you. Other comments? Director Green. Thank you. Um, I've been involved with Howard Street for a really long time, and I don't think people really understand that. I helped write the charter school law in 1999 worked to get the grant for charter school money from the U.S. Department of Education before we had charter schools, hailing Howard Street as the example. And I worked with Joni Gillis, who was the first director of Howard Street, and Paul DiCopolos to write the original first contract because Paul and I were the two attorneys in the state drafting charter school agreements at the time, and this was the first one. It goes back 20 years the work I've done for charter schools and advocated that Howard Street is a charter school. But um, a couple of things have changed in 20 years and a couple of things haven't changed in 20 years. And um, one of the things that we have to do as a school board is look at the entire district. We have 45,000 students plus in our care across this district. One of the things this board did about a year and a half ago was adopt an equity lens. And I think the last speaker spoke about this. Diversity is not equity. Equality, saying every student has the chance to get into Howard Street, is not equity. Equity in our definition in the Salem-Kaiser School District is, and it says in our policy, equity in the Salem-Kaiser School District will not be confused with equality where all students are treated the same. Equity will be attained when the achievements of our historically underserved students match the outcomes of students in the dominant culture, when underserved groups increase in capacity and power, and when barriers to student success have been mitigated 
and eliminated. Equity takes intention. Equity is not saying we've got diverse kids because everybody has diverse kids. And I think the last speaker hit it right on the head. You can look at white kids and have diversity among white kids by their economic, socioeconomic status, or whether they're first time college goers, or whether their parents actually ever graduated from high school. Equity is an intentional action to make sure our underserved populations rise above. And I don't see that happening in Howard Street, unfortunately. And it's been a historical issue that I think you may want to address. I don't think location is going to change equity. Equity is intentional action by individuals to make sure that underserved students get the benefits of what privileged students have had. And we need to rise above the issue of the locational change so we'll get a more diverse student body. Diversity is not equity. It does not meet the definition of our equity lens. And that's the analysis that I have to go through as a school board member sitting here taking a look at this. I think um, we anticipated that we were going to need to take the facility back at some point because in our current contract we had Paula add language around the idea of we're going to have to give you a couple years notice that we may need the facility back knowing that we were growing south salem high school was going to need to grow so we put in our contract we're going to pay for your moving as long as it's within district boundaries we're not going to move you to portland obviously and we would also sign off on ten thousand dollars a year for three years to help you with that issue the other thing is we have to look at our other charter schools we brought all charter schools to 85 percent that's more than the state minimum required Currently, for a K-8 school in the state, it's 80% of your general purpose grant per ADMW. We in the Salem-Kaiser School District believe in our charter schools, and we give them more. We give them 85%. We had them at 100. Now everybody's at 85. If we do this for Howard Street, I think the Optimum Learning, JGEMS, everybody will come to us for that. And I don't think, as a school district that has to look out over 45,000 students, that makes the best sense. I think what you're doing with your students at Howard Street School is fantastic and great, and I wish I could support it. But looking at it through the equity lens, looking at it as I've got to look at it across the school district, you're asking us to finance your loan. We've told other entities that, no, we won't do that as a school district. We need to use our resources for the benefit of all students in the school district. And one of the questions that I asked you was, how much do you have in reserves? Your current budget is $1.2 million. You have 50% in reserves. No other school in the state of Oregon that I'm aware of has 50% reserves. We're lucky in Salem-Kaiser that we have about 7% reserves on a $1 billion budget. And when we have something happen in this school district, we have to dip into those reserves. And we all know that there will probably be another recession coming in the state of Oregon and across the United States. And we have to be able to meet the needs of all students in the district. I'm sorry at this time when I look at it through the equity lens, when I look at it financially, taking in all students in the school district, I just simply cannot support this. So Jim, I'm going to have to reply to some of that. Gotcha. myself and then I will get you Chuck I also have a comment I'd like to make for the whole board okay and one of those is I've heard equity 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 and the way we're looking at equity is slightly different than the way you looked at it 20 years ago then it was a matter of enrollment but <coughs> you're arguing that each school must be given the same as charter schools Ch the same is not equity, as you've pointed out. Some needs are greater than others. Some populations are greater. So I'm not going to look at that part of it in that manner. And Madam Chair, that's your prerogative. I'm looking at the equity lens that this board has adopted. That may be, but I don't, well, <laughs> I, will, I won't argue, but I see it slightly different than you do. Thank you. Just a minute, uh, Chuck, you've been waiting. You know, I've, I've found the whole conversation a little confusing, and it's almost like we're looking at, are we going to renew the charter for Howard Street in a way? Um, to me, the issue really revolves around 
the request for the extra funds. And uh, I think that uh, this isn't a time to debate um, whether or not their admissions policies are appropriate or whatever. It's more of a financial situation. I love Howard Street for a lot of reasons, and uh, they do great work. But I also have to look at the entire district and what we're doing. And uh, I, I agree that if we approve this, we're going to have every charter school coming back for the 100% uh, funding. And so I'm going to be voting no on it, not because I don't believe in Howard Street, not because I, I feel like uh, uh, this is a referendum on equity or whatever. It's just a matter of resources that we have as a board and the long-term effect of doing that. I've been in private education for a long time and uh, 40 years and have worked to find a variety of ways to finance education outside the public school system. And I would offer my uh, advice and, and help to Howard Street to, to find alternative ways of funding uh, this shortfall. Um, but uh, I just feel as a school board member, I have to uh, look at the bigger picture. And please don't interpret that as uh, a guy who is <clears throat> uh, not in favor of Howard Street. Mr. Dukopoulos. Um, just for the board's consideration, as you, as you debate this motion, the reason that I suggested that you in include some language about figuring out the contract language, I, I want you to understand th their proposal for the finances. So right now there is a contract. It's 2018 to 2022, and, in, and that is the only contract that exists for you to modify. The issue is the proposal has a 15% additional ADM, which they call the direct or district relocation transition contribution. Uh, education needed another acronym, and you've got it tonight, I guess. <laughs> uh, but then, for th so, so the process would be in 2022, um, sometime in January, per your <coughs> policy, you'd have to be considering a contract renewal for there to be a new contract. So it's a five-year contract, and it can be five years or seven years. So let's just assume that the contract renewal is five years. So we're talking about a contract for 22, uh, 2022 to 2027 in which there's a 12.5% additional ADM. Well, we don't have that contract yet. Uh, and. Uh, unless you all get reelected for uh, several more terms, you won't even be here deciding that contract renewal. The third contract renewal is, and let's assume that the second contract is a five-year contract. So now in 2027, there's a 10% additional ADM for, th for that five-year term. Now we're in the 27, 2027 to 2032 school years. Uh, and so the, the proposal is to amend the current contract for the f additional 15% for the 100% floor, or the ceiling, I guess they call it. How we write the contract current contract for a future board uh, is troubling to me. Mm -hmm. uh, at most, I think you could say it, that the board's intent in the current contract is essentially for a 10-year window in which uh, uh, additional monies are provided but it, it, and you would be essentially asking the, the next board who considers the contract renewal to stick with the plan. 
because you cannot bind a, a new board. And, uh, and so there are some details here that you, you really need to understand and we need to have a conversation about if, if the motion passes, what is this board saying about the, the next contract other than um, we believe that future boards, as you consider contract renewal, should uh, consider the, this as a, you know, as a glide path down to uh, a payment in full on this building. Uh, but I don't think we can have a contract, we can't modify the current contract to promise both contract renewal or future funding in a contract that's not yet before us. So these are, these are. Uh, I mean, I just, I just have reviewed this over the last couple of days. So I haven't, I haven't even come up with language for you to consider. Uh, but this is, this is not a simple concept. Uh, Director Hyatt. So now that I'm totally confused, uh, I have a different question, though, to confuse you more. So they're, they're wanting to be basically at 100%. So I know there's no apples to apples kind of comparison between a, a charter school and another middle school. But if I were to look at Waldo Middle School and Howard Street and J. Gems, are they all basically funded the same? I mean, isn't Waldo really funded at 100%? because we provide all their services. So isn't Howard Street and J. Gems and Optimal Learning Center funded at a lesser amount than our other students? That's my question. And I know it's not an easy question, there's not a direct answer, but I always come back to, well, we pay 100% of things for kids in Waldo or Adam Stevens. I don't think you would see, I don't, there's not a direct, that's a hard one to answer. Because <laughs> it's, understand. yeah, the it's money like, all comes to the district and it's used for infrastructure of the district and transportation and food service contract and. But they're not using those or they're paying for them, right? No. I mean, Howard yeah. Street. Oh, Howard be, Street. Right. Yeah, they're, so that's what yeah they're correct. May, may I? Yeah. The, so th this board has, a, uh, as Director Green said, a long history with trying to figure this question out. And, and this board has debated the question of <coughs> it, it, the legislature's wisdom in the funding formula uh, of 95% for uh, high schools uh, and uh, K-8 uh, at 80%. Uh, at one point in time, this board uh, had essentially an a la carte menu that, that broke down the per student cost for a wide range of services, nursing services. Um, with 42,000 kids, you divide how much we pay nurses and you come out with a per student cost. And, and the board at that time did that for, for every single service. And that was one way to, to account for the fact that it costs more to run the school system than just a charter school. Um, and, and so th the board has shifted from that, we had our own acronym back then, the net um, uh, allocated resource uh, distribution. Uh, which was this idea that we're going to allocate resources by student um, and, and help pay for the infrastructure that the school system needs. The board's gotten completely away from that, but there is, this, there is a debate about what happens to the extra 15%. Well, where does that go? Well, the legislature says it stays with the school system uh, to pay for all the infrastructure uh, that is required for the uh, for supporting schools and charter schools. That's the long historical answer. And I think the this board has debated the issue of 85 percent, and we should, th um, as a board, just think clearly about um, they're asking for a 
reloc relocation amount. Um, it happens to equal 100%. Um, so th that's one issue you have to wrestle with. And the second issue you have to wrestle with is can you uh, obligate future boards? Mm -hmm. And so it's in some ways a two-part question. Director Hyatt. So, you know, I'm, I'm really torn because I really love charter schools, yet the contract is kind of complicated, and I'm wondering if we need to postpone this, unfortunately, one more time to, to kind of bring it into something that we should have control over versus, you know, trying to tell future boards what to do, you know, bringing it into the time frame of the current contract. I don't know. You said a lot of different stuff, and I, well, <laughs> I wasn't uh, following all of it. Your motion was to... Uh, the motion on the table is to approve the the proposed the modification proposal uh, subject to no, appropriate negotiations on what the contract would look like so there's a lot of room in that motion for us to do the work that's necessary to spell out how would we do this um, in the current contract because that's the only thing we can modify uh, and and what we might end up with is if you pass the motion, you'd end up with a modification of 15% for the remainder of this contract with some language that says for future boards that consider renewal, this was the reasoning that went into the, the funding for the remainder of this contract. And maybe that's as far as we can go uh, but that's that would be a, a, a start because all, they're asking for a modification in this contract. So if I'm understanding, if we said yes to this particular motion, there would be additional negotiation on the contract to get agreeable language and then it would have to come back to the school board for approval. Is that's that right. correct? That is right. Director Lepold. Sure, I have a comment and then I also have a question um, for, for Paul. So first my comment. Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, when Director Green mentioned the equity lens, uh, I would like the community to know that it was, I would like to say that everybody would look through the equity lens. Myself, when I was looking through it, um, I saw Howard Street. Everybody, uh, ev everybody here would agree that they've done excellent work with the students that are in the school. Um, I think we could all be in agreement there. Um, and then so we, if we can agree on that, and if it's kind of general consensus, the fact they were in South Salem and they kind of viewed as a South Salem charter school because that's kind of where they were, that's where a lot of the students went. If they are moved to the North Salem feeder, feeder system, then that would, in my perception, looking through the equity lens, I would view that as in the long run, what would happen is if they're interacting with that community, and they're pulling events and they're knocking on the doors of their neighbors now, okay. then it would change to more of a North Salem charter school, which nothing against South Salem, but North Salem I feel like really needs it, especially because uh, given their the graduation rate and that's we have a big opportunity there to show equity and to show those students that uh, give them opportunities that they haven't, they may not have had because of transportation. And so moving it there, um, I viewed as an equity thing, and if you don't think that's it's fair to talk about their moving, um, I think it's I think it's a fair thing to talk about because the location is is vitally important, especially because we don't transport kids to Howard Street currently, and so who can afford to drive their kid to school every day unless you live nearby or somewhere in the in the area, and so if it, it's if it's in the North Salem next to those houses, it'd be a lot easier for those families to be able to get there, and so I think looking through the equity lens, I think having it there would be an equitable thing and the money that we're spending of course we don't want to spend more money on it um, but I would do so if it gives kids in the North Salem uh, feeder system the opportunity to attend Howard Street and now to my question um, now that we've c talked about the equity lens a little bit and just kind of that perception um, my question for legal standing wise if we do approve this and let's say um, the 2018 through 2022, something that we can, that one's kind of, it doesn't seem questionable. Are you, are you talking about the B and C on the uh, item two on yes. the list? 
um, is it possible if we did approve it for those to be looked at and if for some reason it would create some sort of liability or something that we could take those out or if we approve it is it too late I'm not sure I understand the, exactly okay, my, the question. Could you I guess, phrase it? Yeah, I guess my question is, if we approve this, would it be open for the district to negotiate the terms on this um, in a way that would either, A, of course, be legal, and then, two, um, make sense, so that way we're not uh, obligating future boards? Does that make sense? If you approve the motion, you're approving the concept of three different contracts, only one of which you have control over. So somehow we would have to build in language in the contract that that this is the, the goal of the this board for future board's consideration is this kind of a glide path for the retirement of the debt. Mm -hmm. And and if you but if you took out the next two contracts and all you had was an additional 15 percent for the 2018-2022 school year, it, I mean, it simplifies the contract because all it is is more money in, over the next four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when there's contract renewal, there'll have to be another discussion about the same thing. Uh, and, but if you approve their proposed language in in the in your materials we somehow have to deal with two contracts that extend to 2032 at least but that's not the current motion right now well the current motion is there to as i understand your motion is to approve their modification subject to negotiating appropriate language right and their, and their modification is essentially a 10-year, well, more, more than 10 years, um, uh, modification. Mm. It so includes th essentially three contracts. So do we need another motion to amend the motion? To make it one, <laughs> well, to make it one you know, until I, the end of this contract? I can't make amendments. <laughs> no, but Sorry. I'm wondering if... If we need another one to keep it within the term of the current yeah. contract. Well, I think your options are to uh, approve only the 15% increase for the term of this contract with no other language relating to what would happen <coughs> in the future, if, if that's what you're asking. Director Light. I'm not sure I'm seeing this exactly right, but if Howard Street is looking for $200,000 to relocate to a new facility, why couldn't we just vote yay or nay on allocating $200,000? If I'm, I'm just saying $200,000, I don't know what 15% is, but uh, why couldn't that be? Uh, the yay or nay is allocating money to help them with their relocation expenses. And I'm not sure that would really help them, but I'm just saying that that might make it a, little, a lot cleaner if that was what we were really looking at. They, they have a proposal that's tied to OFA, uh, OFA so that, which we're not part of that deal. So they're, they're tied to a transaction which requires them to show a certain level of income for a debt service payment. That's, that's the, the math formula. And so I don't know, I don't know if that helps the problem. I, I don't know enough about the re relationship with the with the debt service provider. And I know nothing about any of it. I'm just <laughs> trying to find a, a simplification that doesn't tie up future boards. And uh, yeah. And I'm not saying I'd be in favor of that either, because that's another whole set of issues. Uh, Will we start getting other groups coming in asking for two hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> so, but I just throw it out. So. I don't know if, did Paul? Paul, did you have your hand up? Nope. Okay. 
<laughs> so I'm gonna so I appreciate the the discussion and what you raised but uh, you know this does go back to funding debt service for them over a very long period of time and I do believe that this opens us up to other charters coming in asking <coughs> for um, an increase to 100%. We just reset all of our charter schools to 85 uh, to be a little more equal across the board. And I just, I struggle with this because I really, really like Howard Street Charter School. And the things that you do are absolutely amazing. And the testimony that we heard and the success of the students but as Director Green said, we have to look across the district and we are, you know, we're, we're in a very financially tight situation and that's only going to get worse. We know that um, the needs of our students in this district are high. And for us to then give an additional 15% for debt service funding to finance a location, that as Director Lippold said, seemed like a, an A plan, but no B plan. You're, I feel like we're being kind of backed into a corner to finance a particular move when we know that we have financial needs across the district. Um, I've spent many, many meetings and conversations with students um, you know, in the, in the South Feeder School system about the challenges that we have and the lack of resources. And I just can't, and it's, you know, this, the equity issue aside, and I'm, I'm glad that's come up, but I just can't approve another 15% for a charter school when we know we have so much need in this district and we know that the need is increasing and that our resources are not growing. Um, so I, I wish I could, I wish I could say yes, but I can't, I'm sorry. Director Hyen. So I'm wondering if I should remove, drop, delete, I don't know, my motion and change it. Can I do that? Was it your motion or was it? Well, we have a motion on the table. Mm -hmm. Right. So the motion can be amended. I made it with your help. <laughs> <laughs> so you can amend, you can, you can offer an amendment and then there has to be a second and then there would be discussion on the amendment. Okay, so I would like to amend my motion to provide 15% increase for the remainder of the current contract. Beyond that, that has to be another board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand having gone through this with JGEMS, you know, you have a, a building that's paid for, the heat's paid for, I'm assuming, and everything, and all of a sudden you don't. And it's, it's really hard. It was hard for the parents, too. We had to contribute money for field trips and things that f previous parents didn't have to do. There was, there was just a lot more because we were forced to move. We didn't want to move. And, you know, I think it's kind of like no fault of your own. I know I'm gone beyond the motion, and now I'm discussing, but yeah. sorry. You need a second to the motion. <laughs> yeah, I know. You need a second. Need a second. To the motion. So my motion was just the first part. 15% <laughs> increase for the remainder of the current contract okay. period. That is then the amended motion. And this is the amended second. We have amended motion and amended second. And then well, all those other words were my discussion. <laughs> is there any further discussion? Well, there is. We don't even know if that will meet their needs because they need, this is, this is debt service for a bond that they're trying to, to go out for. So we can say that this is what we're going to do and we're going to limit the amount, but we don't know that that actually meets their needs. So No, we don't. I, but the motion's on the table and it's been right. amended, so right. we need to vote on it. Okay. And then we can have a further amendment depending on how that goes. And, and if this doesn't meet the requirements of your lender, then, you know, I, I, I would think that maybe they need to get together maybe with our legal counsel and figure out yeah. what would and then see if the board's agreeable or not. But right now we don't know because we're not a part of that negotiation. Our next board meeting. January 15th. Okay. There is another board meeting January 15th. So, Madam Chair, you have a motion 
amended motion before the body. Right. And if there's no more discussion, you'll have to deal with that motion. True, but that was my part in the discussion. Okay, if sorry. that is <laughs> <just trying> to <laughs> be acceptable. I'm just trying to be helpful. <laughs> Some Mac. <laughs> okay. okay, let's vote on the motion that came from Director Hyen. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Madam Chair, aye. can I clarify aye. real quick? Yeah. We are voting on the amended motion. Yes. Right. Okay. All those. Opposed? Hold on, you need to call for in favor again, Madam Chair. I don't think Alice got it. I was talking over the top. Yeah. Okay, uh, all those in favor of the amended motion, which is to continue or to move to 100% for the length of time of the existing contract. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. 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 Uh, it appears there's three in favor and two opposed. Four Mr. opposed. Mi four. Missed. Four opposed. Four Mr. Opposed. Kylo. I have no. You? No. Okay. Um, the motion fails um, through Mr. Kylo's vote. The, mission, the <laughs> motion fails in a five to four to three. Four to three vote. Four to three vote. So now you have the original motion in front of the body. The, it was failed to amend the motion. You have the original motion in front of the body. Which also failed. We haven't oh, voted on it yet. We haven't voted on yeah. it yet. Yeah. Yeah. need to take a vote for that. Okay. On the original motion, Mr. Kylo, do no. you have something to say? I do not yet. So. So where we are now is we're back at the original motion. There's been discussion. You can ask people if they would like more discussion, or if there's no discussion, then you vote on the original motion. Is there more discussion? Would you, re Hyen. Would you repeat the interpretation you gave me of my motion one more time, please? <laughs> Your motion is to approve Howard Street's proposed language in your action item which covers um, th three contracts uh, both the current contract and any additional following charter agreement at 12.5 additional ADM and 10 percent for a subsequent charter agreement after that subject to successfully negotiating the legal issues uh, uh, to be approved by the board. I'm not going to repeat that. Does every <laughs> director <laughs> understand <laughs> what we're voting on? So my question is, basically, we could end up where with the motion that we just voted down. No, you're after you do the negotiation. With, you're ending up with your original motion, which was to. Uh, and which was to approve Howard Street's after proposal. After you talked to them, though, you said with Except contract to. changes to make it within our rules. So wouldn't that, in effect, end up being kind of the motion I made, the amended motion? Wouldn't that be kind of where we would probably end up anyway? It would include your amended motion because we would be dealing with the current contract. And then we'd have to do something in the current contract that speaks about future years. That's, in essence, what we'd have to do. There's some other technical things I haven't bothered to bring up tonight on how, how we, to make this happen, uh, which is not important for the purpose of your motion. Well, we stirred the pot. <laughs> yeah. I have a comment. Director Lifold, we first need to, oh. let's go ahead and act on Mr. Dacopoulos' motion sure. that everyone said they understood. And then we'll yes. go back and if there is another motion. No, that's done. I think the record that ought to reflect done. it's actually Director Hayen's motion. Yes. Hayen's motion, oh, yeah. it's not. I'm sorry, um, Paul, you can't make motions okay. for the body, already, already revealed but that. I think we yeah. understand that what the motion is, and it's actually Marty's motion. 
No, but you can only amend the motion. So we're not going to be able yeah. to, if we vote, we're not going to be able to go back and make another motion. You either amend this one again, or we, or we vote. But or we've already have, amended it. You can, I mean, there could be an entirely new motion, but we're not, the, we're not there yet. Okay. All we're, yeah. We have the motion we have. Okay, there's motion on the table. Motion. All vote. those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Who, that, That's Director Hyen. Mm -hmm. All those signifying their negative vote by saying no. 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 Hmm. The no's are recorded as to uh, Director Kylo, Director Lee. Can I comment now? Director Blaze, Blaze and Blasi. <laughs> Director Lipold. Were you a no? I was a no. Yes. Thank you. And I and was too. Director Green. So at this point, it's five to two. And the motion fails. Five to two or six to one? Did you, Chair, did oh, you vote? She did. Okay. She voted. Got yes. It. Five to two. So I'm in there on the no side. No, you're on the yes, yes side. The yes side. They, yes. Uh, no. I'm on it on the no because I one. thought that was. Six to one. I'm the only one so that voted six to yes. One, then. I'm the only one that voted yes. Okay. Six to one. Our board secretary, the one being uh, Director Hyen, all the rest were no. Where do we go from here? Do we want another motion? Well, it's up or? to the board. If you have another motion, it can be made relating to the Howard Street proposal. If not, you move on. I would say. If not, how about we take about a five minute break yeah. Yeah. before we go on to our next action item, if that would be okay with you, Madam Chair? It would be. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to lead the crowd. <laughs> Maybe we should make a motion to add a third floor. We need to go back into that is really cool. That's a cool our meeting. One of the options we're facing right now, and we're obviously in a little disarray, and rather than make the motion, I would like to make the suggestion that um, possibly with the help of our attorney, who is familiar with these things, and even the help of Ms. Director Green, possibly, that if you wish to proceed with the charter school, that you come back on our next meeting, which is um, December 13th? January. January. January 13th. That gives quite an extra break. And I hope it doesn't cause a lot of problems for lenders and what have you. But that seems to be the best way to go at this time. Yes, Mr. Kylo. I'm, I'm, I need a clarification of what you just said. I said they may come back and we that was that was no. The preface to what you said was if they want if the charter school wants to continue, do you mean with this process or continue as a charter school? The way it was stated, it could have been either way. So I would like some clarification because I, will be happy I don't to believe clarify. we voted to close Howard Street. So I may. I don't make the motion, I make the suggestion that um, if Charter Street Howard, Howard Street <laughs> Charter School wishes to come back and consider the process we've been discussing for an hour and a half, then they're free to do so and we'll make room for on your, on our calendar for December 13th. January 15th. 15th. January, January 15th. I want people to know three people have told me it's the 13th, so <laughs> I better not see them. But it's in January 15th. Yes. We don't have another meeting. Uh, <coughs> I'd just like to make one more comment based on our previous vote and all the discussion. 
I was incorrect on one particular thing. Uh, Howard Street was asking for up to 15%, not always 15%. They plan to do fundraising to earn as much of that money as they can on their own, which I really appreciate. And it wasn't plan A or B for them. This was plan D or E. They had looked at lots of different options. And so they really have done a lot of work on that, and I really appreciate that, and I just wanted to put that out there. Well, I think, well, I have a lot of trouble <clears throat> really crowding an operation and organization that I think is doing a wonderful job. So I do hope you return. So next thing on the agenda is the superintendent's reports. Yeah. No, contract. Superintendent's contract. contract. Oh, the superintendent's contract. So I, I am responsible for some initial discussions on this as the board's legal counsel. I am responsible for helping board leadership draft the original contract, contract amendments. And so I have uh, been assisting uh, board leadership in uh, redrafting some portions of the employment agreement contract between Superintendent Perry and the school board. Just by way of history, this board unanimously extended the last contract. And the only thing remaining to be decided was some compensation issues. And so the board's already voted to extend this contract um, last March unanimously. And, and so at this point, I'm just going to point out to you some of the changes. Um, uh, section one, the term changes because we now have a 2018 to 2021 contract, a three-year contract, just like the last contract. Um, so that's a change in section one. Section four, the, the salary provisions are identical. Uh, but what we did, and I, I want to thank Alice Struckmeyer for all her work on this because she actually read through this with such a fine tooth comb that we found some typos that I'm not going to mention tonight. Uh, but thank you very much for your help with this. Uh, so for section four, which is the compensation or the salary section, what we did is to make it more easy for folks to understand how the math works for the compensation. So instead of simply having percentages um, and, uh, and mentioning a starting salary, but not where would superintendent be during the second year of a contract or third year. We actually did the math for the board, uh, but this is not a change in compensation. This is the same compensation schedule that you approved by extending the contract in March, but you just have the numbers here to help explain it. Um, another change was in um, uh, Section 11, the fringe benefits. Um, what we did is to delete uh, a sentence relating to the tax sheltered annuity, uh, which improperly inferred that the that the superintendent would be uh, responsible for any payroll costs associated with that, where in fact a tax sheltered annuity um, is tax sheltered. Uh, and so we deleted that language because it was, um, not, it was not correct with respect to the tax sheltered annuity plan. And we added this last sentence about the $250 a month um, in district uh, car allowance. Um, that was in the contract, um, and she has been paid that while she's been a superintendent here uh, because she gets to participate in all fringe benefits other administrative employees of the district have, and that included the, the car allowance. We wanted to set it out uh, in, its, uh, in its own sentence just so everyone understood um, that that was, the, that was the case. There was one more. Um, rewrite that that Ms. Struckmeyer and I talked about late last week and I we didn't have a chance to put it in the 
uh, discussion background, and that is on section 21, there was an attorney fee provision um, that was um, so complicated um, that uh, I, re I simply rewrote it so it was more understandable. It's the same meaning, uh, the language is just easier to understand. Uh, and other than a few typos, that's, that's in essence the contract before you tonight. So you've, again, you've already voted on the contract extension and all you would be voting on are the, um, of the three amendments uh, plus the fourth one I mentioned in section 21. I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, about that. So I don't have any. I don't have any questions, but I did want to speak to this because um, Chair Goss and I negotiated uh, the terms of the contract with the superintendent and then ran it through legal, and we also discussed it with each individual board member. And I want to point out one thing. The superintendent did not ask for any changes in her contract. Um, she is very cognizant of the fact that we are in a, you know, in a, a challenging financial time, and so she asked for the same provisions. And yes, there are, you know, there is a cost of living, um, and then there is an escalation cost of four percent that has been in the contract up to date. So this is the same contract that was negotiated by the previous board and the board leadership. And I wanted to point out too that um, we also took a very close look at comparable districts with regards to size, complexity, uh, leadership, and um, and I will say that our superintendent still um, will not be making the same amount that Portland and Beaverton um, superintendents are making. Um, Beaverton being a slightly smaller school district, but again, I think she was very cognizant of our, our current financial situation and was respectful of that, and, and I, I respect that she was willing to um, you know, just ask for the same terms and conditions um, for the next three years. Any other comments? Yeah. I have a question. Jim has a comment. Uh, Director Green. Uh, Paul, under section four, I think you may have missed one of the typos. <laughs> Third paragraph down, it's the Oregon Public Employees Retirement System. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're right. That's the only comment I had other so than when we make the motion. in section four as well. Yeah, it's the PERS is the Oregon Public Employees right. Retirement right. System. All right, uh, someone else had a comment or? Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to say something. So uh, first I wanna thank Christy for everything that she does. I mean, she puts up, um, I mean, first off, she puts up with all of us, so that's cool. And then, um, I mean, just the, the amount of um, hardships our community has and the uh, diverse population we have and everybody being so passionate in our community that like we are um, it's an enormous responsibility to take on um, as a superintendent of the Salem Kaiser School District and so I just want to first off just thank you for that um, just say that um, I mean theoretically if we had enough money to do everything I mean we give you a raise we <coughs> do every, everything else we could to help our students right we do everything uh, everything that we could we fully fund education uh, I mean of course with the times that with the way things are I mean of course maybe not all of that's possible um, but secondly I, I would like to ask the question of um, just really quick I'm, I'm just wondering procedurally because um, we don't really know what the budget is in, for the next few years and so I'm wondering why we're doing it right now is there is there a reason I'm assuming there is I just well there's a reason we're in the third year of the contract okay and we had hoped to get this done um, in, you know, in March uh, of the second year. And now we're okay. in December of the third year. Okay. So, uh, and there's a three-year contract. Got it. So we're just super late on, on getting it done. If that makes sense. So, Madam Chair, I would move uh, approval of the 
proposed contract for the superintendent as presented with the one change and maybe if there's other typos caught but I would move uh, approval of the superintendent's contract as presented I'll second se I'll second that it's been stated uh, it's been motion it's been made by director green and seconded by Simultaneously, Director Lippold. <laughs> Stereo. <laughs> Director Lippold's been very busy tonight, no, so Chuck we'll expect <laughs> we'll accept Director Lee's second. Madam Chair, if I could just offer a couple of comments real quickly. One, I want to thank you and Vice Chair for sitting down, negotiating, and going through this. I've done a superintendent's contract as chair. Um, it's a you try to strike a balance and you're trying to represent the district as a whole while still trying to keep a superintendent employed so I know it takes time I know it takes effort so I want to thank both of you for that when the public looks at our contract they're going to look at the number and that's what's probably going to be reported in the press and I would like to say that if you take a look at an entity that is as large as the Salem Kaiser School District with as many employees with a billion dollar budget operating a transportation system that is second in size to TriMet only in the state of Oregon. I think it's the third or fourth food operation program in the state as well. Um, and trying to deal with all the issues of being a public entity and how many hours I know Christy puts in on the job. Um, I, I don't think her salary <clears throat> actually reflects the value of the work that she does. So I just want to say I appreciate what Christy does on behalf of the district. I know the public will look at that and go, well, she makes over $200,000. Yeah. But look at the entity that we have put her in charge of. And it is a huge operation. And it has multiple facets that come and go out of this school district. And also, we put her in charge of providing educational services to over 45,000 students in the second largest school district in the state. And I think she's done a very good job and I'm glad that she's willing to accept the contract. And again, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, thanks for your work on this. Any other comments, questions? So I wanted to comment again, um, my previous comments were with regards to the contract negotiation, but I want to echo what um, Director Green just said. There has been a lot that you've undertaken and there is a lot coming up. You know, you were incredibly instrumental in passing, you know, a $620 million bond so that we can address capacity issues in this district. And now we're going through redistricting, which is challenging and we so much appreciate your leadership and i heard a rumor that our graduation rates may have improved but you know i can't say for sure but <laughs> i may have heard a rumor um, you've taken on a lot and um, you have focused on diversity and equity and um, you know I, I can't even imagine how many hours you put in I, i'm pretty sure it's about 22 hours a day seven days a week so I just wanted to thank you and thank you for, for accepting, well, you haven't accepted it yet, but <laughs> please accept it. <laughs> so I also would back up all those comments and I would say again that when the district made the choice to hire Christy Perry, it was a wonderful one and we put out all kinds of feelers and we did some national searches and we were very fortunate to have someone like Christy locally in this area that understood how we operate and I think she deserves every penny of this and the local press may call me if they wish <laughs> any other comment yeah I've been I think I've been on the board longer than any, anyone else uh, at this table and uh, Christy you're just awesome thank you for everything that you do and uh, I've just been so impressed uh, with the work that you do and your dedication and and uh, you're an inspiration to a lot of people in this district thank you we need director Hyann I'll just say I agree with everything I heard. I won't say anything else because you know I, I cry easy and so do you and we'll both be crying. So we'll leave it at that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Motion was by Director Green, the second one 
by Director Lee. All those in favor? Aye. Please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right, we have unanimously, not unanimously, but we have passed this on a six to one vote. The next section we need to go to is the consent budget. And um, the, first the first section of the consent budget Consent agenda. Consent calendar. consent agenda. Consent calendar. Does anyone wish to pull an item from the consent calendar? Calendar. <clears throat> Director Blasey. My apologies. Turn to it very quickly. Um, I was going to ask that the superintendent speak briefly to our secondary education funding for uh, career pathways. Um, when I first read this, I wasn't sure if it was, you know, our um, measure $98 or um, so I was hoping for a little clarification on these funds. So I would move adoption of the consent calendar other than item G18P1 secondary career path funding on grant budgets. Second. We have a motion by Director Green and a second by Me. Director Kylo. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, we pass unanimously on the acceptance of grants. We have the one that was pulled, though, Madam Chair, before us. Director Blasey had a question to the superintendent. That's right. <clears throat> all right, so you've uh, passed the uh, personnel actions, and I'll move us on to the um, grants. So the secondary career pathway funding, um, this year's a total of $271,000. And um, this is specific to our uh, state-certified CTE programs, and it is meant to incentivize programs to be certified and to uh, have uh, college credit attached to their program, so an articulation to a college program, primarily community college, and then also to serve our underrepresented um, students. So uh, there's a point system awarded by ODE, so this is different than Measure $98. And each of the programs in our district, you can see uh, the dollars um, that they're getting. So construction trades, for example, at our career technical education centers uh, earned through that point system uh, over $14,000. And um, each year we see the CER programs get additional dollars. And the way we uh, allow expenditure of these dollars is back to those programs. So our uh, CTE coordinator, the CTE teacher, and the principal make some additional investments in those programs as a result of these dollars. So it really speaks to our comprehensiveness of our career technical education programs and that they're sta uh, state approved, clearly articulated with the community college, serving our underrepresented uh, students and there's a certain number of coursework in it. So that's uh, this particular grant. <coughs> Further comments? I'd move adoption of that particular grant. Second. Second. Seeing no more discussion, is there a mo we have a motion by Director Green. Is there a second? Second. Director Kylo. Director Kylo. Uh, seeing not, no more, we'll Call vote. Up. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We passed the, the, except the grant issue. We'll move on to, you mentioned personnel actions. You've Did already completed that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, readings, we have none this evening. But we do have some reports by the superintendent. All right, so our first report is executive limitation number seven, budget and financial planning. And I just want to um, kind of gear you to some uh, changes 
um, from last year's report. So under number one, the district uh, estab board established priorities as established by the results policy. This is our evidence of compliance and we went back to our budget message from last year where we had investments in behavioral learning, uh, the approved math curriculum, uh, level of stability of staffing and resources to grow our graduation rate and invest in student health and special education. So that uh, demonstrates to you how we've worked through the budget process. Um, also, um, we, number two, our budget guide to the community is how we work to have a summary in an understandable format. You have our most recent um, budget guide in front of you tonight. Um, it's a good chance to take a look at that. And then um, also under number six, plans for expenditures for any fiscal year. Um, just as a reminder, last year you completed two uh, supplemental budgets, one in um, as a result of the change in the funding at the legislature, and then a second supplemental because of how we approve our grants in the consent calendar each year, so you did that in June. Um, I'm going to go on to number nine as we think about uh, the fiscal soundness of the district. Uh, remember that uh, the legislature provided the money 50-50 in the first year of the biennium. This is the second year of the biennium. So in that first budget, we budgeted at 49% uh, so that the programs we had in year one would be sustainable uh, through uh, year two. And then um, one... Uh, just a note under pending executive limitation information. Uh, as suggested by the auditors, we have adjusted the grant approval and authorization language in the board plate to utilize clear appropriation categories such as facilities, acquisition, and construction. Um, so that's my report, and I'd open it up for questions, and I believe uh, Director Blasi has another comment around pending EL information. Okay. So actually, uh, Sorry, of course I always have a question. I don't know, so Director Green might know the answer to this. Under financial planning and budgeting, um, I'm, all, I'm curious as to whether or not this is where a discussion about um, fiscal prudence with regards to PERS liability. Um, I, I just, I wanna comment that I have been very impressed with how this school district has handled the current and upcoming PERS liability, um, which is crippling other school districts. Um, it's, you know, it's gonna be a huge part of the legislative discussion this session. Um, it was part of the business summit last week, but I have always been impressed with how Salem-Kaiser School District has managed the upcoming debt. And yes, it is creating a, obviously, um, a challenge for us as well, but it has been handled very well. It was one of the very first questions I had for Mike Wolf and um, Christy Perry when I was considering running for the board is how are we planning for this? And I think that there are very, well, I shouldn't, I, I don't know, but I know that this district has planned well and I think that this falls under this. And um, I just went to, Mike's not here, but just compliment the district on how it is handled that um, how we've handled the, the PERS debt. That has taken the faith of uh, a number of previous boards as well. So it's been a consistent strategy uh, through uh, multiple superintendents and multiple boards um, mm -hmm. to really care for that upcom upcoming liability. I will align myself with that, but I'd also like to make the comment that despite how how we handle them, it still has hurt. We are yep. still behind the behind where we would want to be. That all so the if, there's any, if there's any other questions, uh, Director Blasi has one additional comment on another pending EL. Okay. Oh, let me get to that. So a question or a, a comment was raised, um, I believe, in our last last month's um, regarding um, an executive limitation, and <clears throat> it was with regards to hiring practices by the superintendent in the district. And I wanted to let um, the public know because it was brought up publicly in the board um, that uh, both 
uh, Chair Goss and myself um, took a very close look at the concern that was raised and, um, you know, looked at everything with regards to the executive limitation um, language and the hiring practice. And I don't, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because it is a personnel issue, but we also, um, you know, had a discussion with um, the district's attorney. And so I want to just do a, a very quick summary without going into the details, but based on the review um, that uh, a couple of statements, um, it was determined by both our review and the attorney's review was that the, the contract that we were discussing um, was legal um, and that the co contract followed past practice. It is consistent with the district, um, what we've done in the um, done in the past that um, board members knew about the process prior to the board meeting where this came up um, and that we as a board voted unanimously to approve this contract and um, after voting to approve the contract um, there was a, a question raised and so again just in summary in consultation with our legal counsel and um, a review and I will tell you I did a a pretty in-depth review and um, had some conversations just around the practice because it did raise some questions. I just, I didn't completely understand the process, but um, it was determined that there was not um, an EL violation. And so I just wanted to report back because it was raised publicly. And Director Blasi and I agree on that. And went through it very carefully and I believe that it was all done properly and legally. Okay, we now have report. All right, so the uh, next report is on the boundary review task force and it is uh, in your board packet with written information. And so I don't think I'll focus on it as I'm hoping that across town they have uh, wound up their meeting already, and hopefully they have a recommendation for you that will be coming into the boardroom uh, in January. What I want to say, though, is that the I really believe in kind of watching how our internal group has worked, that they've done really hard work and engagement <coughs> and changing up how they um, have worked hard to engage our families. And while there still could, there's always going to be room for improvements in that, it's probably one of the better community engagement pieces I've uh, seen uh, for a while. So I just want to um, thank the um, kind of the internal group that's been outlining that. Marty. So um, given the complicated nature of the boundary uh, mm -hmm. review and uh, maybe the possible recommendations, mm -hmm. who knows how complicated they might be, if there's any way we can get them before our normal Friday before the board meeting so we can really look at them, study them, and make sure we, you know, see if we have any questions or not, to give us a little extra time, that would be appreciated. And, and it's up for a first reading, is that correct? That is we correct. We would not be voting nope. on it at our mm -hmm. January I, meeting. And we may need, like more time. We may though. need additional yeah. readings with that and, one. But. And what we might also do is uh, put it into more of a work session format so you can really take the time to understand uh, the recommendations and the changes, then go into a first reading same night, and then um, bring it back for a second reading. Okay. So you have, you have time in the process, even though it was supposed to come at this meeting. That would be nice. Yeah. I trust you and board leadership to figure out a schedule so we'll yes. have time to look yes. at yes. it. Yes, you want. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, we move on. Yep. All right, our next report um, is uh, one in a multiple part series. Uh, we thought it was important to begin uh, talking in the boardroom about some of our student needs. So this is just a quick, um, beginning of that conversation and he'll outline where we are and where we're headed with some additional board information. Thank you right. for that. Dr. And Sproles. Dr. Sproles. <laughs> um, so good evening board uh, chairperson Goss um, and I appreciate uh, that we're talking about students at, what, at what's been a very long board meeting and I think it helps situate some of the discussions a little bit so I appreciate um, the time given <clears throat> to talk a little bit about <clears throat> some emergent student needs that we are seeing 
um, coming up through the school district. Um, these are complex student behaviors that students are exhibiting in our classrooms and we'll focus a little bit on what that looks like um, for, our, for our classrooms and for our schools. Um, the most prevalent behaviors are coming with some of our youngest kids, which is something that's different than I've, I've been in education for 25 years in elementary schools for 20 of those 25 years and it's, it's, it's different now than it has been in the past. And so we have some reasons for why that might be, um, but it, it means it's a complex issue. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what the behaviors look like. I'm gonna explain a little bit about some early ideas as to what causes might be that might be contributing to this. We'll talk about some promising practices. And then as Superintendent Perry alluded to, this is the first touch point of, of several different presentations that we'd like to present to you um, just to gain some awareness as to um, both what the situation is and uh, some initial steps that we're taking as a school district. So we've seen throughout the school district an increase in both the intensity and the frequency of complex student behaviors. Um, some evidence of this is that across the school district, we've seen an increase in requests for room clears. And room clears occur when there's a student who's become emotionally upset, um, what we might call dysregulated, so has a hard time controlling his or her emotions. And instead of removing the student who's upset, we remove the rest of the students. And I'll explain why we do that in just a minute. Um, we've also seen a lot of requests both from our teachers and from our building principals for outside assistance, seeking help on how to address these complex behaviors. We have seen a large uptick in our counseling referrals. Those are K-12. We talk, we've talked a lot about those counseling referrals at the high school level, but they come from K-12 as evidence. And even in our pre-K program, we now have added a behavior cadre person in response to referrals that are coming from some four and five-year-old students who are entering our classrooms and entering our spaces as well. Um, we've also seen an uptick in behavior and safety plans. And a behavior plan is where there's a student who's exhibiting complex behaviors over a certain amount of time, and we need to create an individualized plan to support that student. Um, I can tell you, I, when I was a principal, when I first started, maybe I would do one or two of these a year. Um, as my, my last year in Greater Albany, we did 18 at my, at my school in Greater Albany. So these behavior plans and safety plans, they're not small little, um, little plans. We bring the family in, we bring counselors in when we set up a, a comprehensive plan. Um, and across our district, our schools are providing more and more of these plans. And ultimately, those lead to safety plans as well. And that's so we can um, try to ensure the safety of all the students in the classrooms. So um, framing this discussion a little bit then, I think is also some rules that have been put in place with, I think, really strong intent and really strong purpose around how we can um, physically restrain students at school. And I think a lot of times when we think about a physical restraint, you think about a restraint is when we hold down a student or we try to, try to physically move a student from one place to another place. But what that might look for a kindergartner is if there's a kindergartner who becomes dysregulated and we go in and put our hands on the kindergartner, that's a physical restraint. So the threshold for when we can do that um, is very, very high um, because we have new regulations around that. So the threshold is it can only be done if the, if the student imposes an imminent risk of bodily injury. So a lot of times as a parent, I have, I have two kids, when my kids were throwing a fit in the grocery store, what every parent does is you go and pick them up. And, and, you, and you carry that kid out, and then you debrief with them outside of that setting. So a lot of times, our first instinct as parents, um, and not understanding their five, why are we removing an entire class of 20 other students because we have a dysregulated five-year-old? But part of that is, is because we have really, really tight guidance on when we can physically restrain. We also have tight guidance that um, just in the last two years have come on why we can suspend a student. So when in in the past, when there's a student who's become dysregulated, we could suspend them, have meetings with the families, create a safety plan moving forward. The threshold for suspension now is that the student has um, um, enacted bodily harm or has a serious imminent threat to enact bodily harm. So the threshold for when we can remove kids, and again, 
please don't take this at, I, I think those are good things that we are trying to reach every single student, but it does change the way that we can, um, we can interact with students. And that is coming at a time when students are showing up different. So we have these laws that have been passed and we have our students showing up differently than they have in the past. Director Hine, would you like to? I have a question. Of course. I mean, we've had teachers come here before and, and say that they've been hit or somehow harmed, but I haven't, I mean, I don't know if these particular children get suspended because they did cause bodily harm, do they? Um, suspended? It depends on the circumstance. That's, that's the complicated answer to that question. There are students that have behavior plans around their individualized needs and those students could exhibit behaviors where at times they would get suspended for that and at times they don't. Um, it depends on the extent of the injury. Um, and that is a concern that we'll be addressing throughout one of our presentations is okay. working closely. Um, is Mindy still? Work, we're, we've, we're working closely with our association, um, both for our licensed staff and our classified staff to try to, to try to think about that issue as well. So thank you for bringing that up. So what do these behaviors look like? I, and, I, and I think that um, sometimes it's hard to picture what this could look like in a school setting. So um, scientists have a long time said that there's two different ways that behaviors can be exhibited, and they can be exhibited as internalizing behaviors, and this can be a student who refuses to engage, who refuses to complete work, and basically they have difficulty connecting with others. So that's the classical student who's the middle schooler that has the hood over his head in the back of the room and has a really hard time navigating relationships. That student is exhibiting behaviors, they're just internalized behaviors, and we don't talk about them as much, um, and possibly, and we should. And I worry about the internalizers as much as I worry about the externalizers. The externalizers are much, much easier to identify. Um, they become easily frustrated. It can lead to physical outbursts, which can lead to physical aggression, but also verbal aggression, even with some of our students at a, at a young age. Um, they have relatively low academic resilience. And so something um, as, as innocuous as a 10-minute math quiz for someone who's in a heightened state already and is ready to, to um, not be able to maintain their emotions, something that's small like that, they don't have the resilience to complete it. And it can lead to a physical outburst. Um, which again, Director Hyen, to get back to your idea, it's really hard for the teacher to know, is this 10 minute? Is this, is this math test going to be something that we're going to need to figure out and regulate? So you know, it's, it leads to that feeling at times. And in overall, there's a difficulty re regulating emotions, and that's that notion of dysregulation. So students can cycle up, but they have a really hard time cycling back down to a feeling of normalcy um, when they're cycled up into that state. So unfortunately, um, we are not the only school district that's experiencing these trends. There's similar trends across the state of Oregon in every school district and every school. Um, kids are showing up different and schools are struggling with how to respond to that. Um, as you all know, we, uh, the legislature have um, gone through the state and I, I think they had 60 committee meetings, 42 different schools and school districts that they, that they visited. Number one issue at elementary schools was how to deal with emergent student needs, particularly related to behaviors. Number two issue was safety and well-being at school. And those two things are really highly um, intermixed. So we aren't the only um, district that's, that's doing this. We are one of the districts that's trying some innovative practices that I'm excited about and proud, about and proud for and I would love to share with you. Um, just a touch point, if, if you have time sometime this week, you, you might have heard about Oregon Public Broadcasting. They're doing this, this um, ongoing radio show called The Class of 2025. And what they did was they went to a kindergarten group out in Earl Boyles, uh, David Douglas, it's out in outer southeast Portland, and they identified 27 kindergartners that they're going to follow from K to 12. And they follow them even if they stay in David Douglas or the ones that they both hi they highlighted most recently, neither, neither of them are still in David Douglas. One kid's at a school district at the, on the coast, and another is a transitionally homeless student who's been in a whole bunch of different school districts. So the two boys that they studied, the class is now, wrote, is now moving up into middle school. 
Um, one of the kids has um, experienced a lot of trauma at home. Um, has a, as a mom who was who was who he needed to be removed from the home because of some of her behaviors. So he's in DHS custody, um, and he went from a student that was struggling academically to now a student that was struggling mightily behaviorally to the point where he had to just go on tutoring and only be able to have touch points at school for a few hours a week. Um, that's the Dale story. And then the Ethan story is a student who's been transitionally homeless. And he talks a lot about um, the ongoing stress of food scarcity and housing scarcity and how that passes through our children. Um, I think they're, they're really um, interesting insights. And so if you, if, for me, it, it, it really was a touching story. Um, and I think it, it, it explains some things going on. So what are causes for these? And, and when, we, when we go through causes, there can be, ch there can be children who experience um, these types of behaviors that, that haven't experienced a lot of trauma. But trauma can help explain um, for some students um, what's going on. And so the ACEs um, is a scientific framework to study how positive and negative experiences that happen at really key times. And so it's usually um, from birth to three years old. So how ACEs in someone's life can, can set um, a path for them in the future. Now it's important to remember none of this is predictive. So just because um, a child experiences violence and abuse or extreme poverty, that's not a predictive life course, of course, we know that. But it is something where they need to overcome things that other kids might not. And those kids can show up to different, to go up to show up to school differently than other kids. Um, the key area for ACEs is that kids not um, feeling like they have control over their environment. They are, um, they don't have control over the stressors that are impacting them. Um, and the notion of long-term prevalent environmental stressors is what people are studying now as a particularly important um, stressor for students. So one of the interesting things with ACEs is that it, it um, impacts socio-emotionally, as we might think. But there's also a ton of research out there around someone who has a high ACE score, which is someone who's experienced lots of different um, levels of abuse, also has physical um, things. It passes through their bodies differently. Much, much higher rates of asthma, much higher rates of chronic heart disease, um, much higher rates of ambulatory problems, and so tripping and falling and not getting um, care for that, and so having problems. So there's a lot of physical um, ways that these environmental stresses pass through a person. Um, and these don't stop when, when, the, when the child gets to be an adult. These are life, lifelong stressors. Um, ultimately, um, a high ACE score statistically does lead to an earlier death, so an earlier death rate. So it's a physical thing as well as a emotional and social. So this just shows as, as your ACEs score increase, um, your risk of having um, high emotional, physical, and mental health outcomes, um, negative outcomes, um, increase as well. So um, that's really hard to hear. <laughs> that's hard to hear for, for educators. And I can tell you, um, as a building principal, I had a really good idea how to move the dial for a kid who didn't know how to read. I, 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 have, a, I have a pretty pretty good idea how to do that. I have a pretty good idea how to take a student who doesn't speak very much English and get them to speak English by the time they're going through in fifth grade. I, have a, I had a pretty good idea. I felt pretty confident that I can do that. Um, the, the confidence level of dealing with students that are bringing these complex needs, we don't have that same confidence level as a system because their complex needs and the answers are very complex as well. And a lot of times they're individualized and then something changes and then we need a new answer. So one idea that has been prevalent, um, particularly in the literature for the last few years, is this idea of building resilience. So things like, I loved the Four Corners, parents and their families that got up, celebrating kids' success. That's a small little drop in the resilience bucket for that for those kids. They feel like they're, they're successful at school. They're showing up to school. They're collectively celebrating that as a community. That's a, re, that's a mark of resilience. That can help counter, counteract some of these other stressors that they're experiencing. 
And just because you have a high ACEs score, um, most people still who have high ACEs score still grow up to, and I love that quote, they love well, they work well, they parent well, and they engage well. So it's not something that can't be overcome, but it is something that we need to pay attention to. So here are some promising practices that um, have been established. First of all, we need to work really hard to identify the underlying causes of behaviors. When a seven-year-old acts out, the seven-year-old is communicating something to us. They might not have the words to say, hey, we don't have enough food at home, or they might not have the words to say, I'm feeling emotionally dysregulated because the bus is so loud and I can't handle all of that input. But they're showing us that something's going on, and they're showing us through their behaviors. So thinking about behaviors as communication, as a form of communication, I think is important, and identifying the underlying causes, and then teaching those lagging skills, just like we would in reading. We don't expect a kid who doesn't read by the time they're five to read by the time they're six. But sometimes we expect a kid who is having uh, lots of behavioral issues to somehow be a different kid by the time in one year, and that's probably not going to happen. So we need to teach lagging skills over time. Um, we also know the power of nurturing relationships. Every single teacher that I've ever worked with wants to have a deep relationship with his or her kids. That's, that's why they're teachers. And one of the really difficult things is it's hard to have relationships with kids who have experienced trauma because they're distrusting. So you have to build up that trust and then build it up again and then show up again and build it up again. And that's hard. And it's hard to build that relationship with their families as well. So creating environments worth nurturing relationships makes a difference. Um, having predictable environments, especially for a student who doesn't feel like they have a lot of agency in their life, is important as well. And predictability means that when I misbehave, there's a correction for that. That's predictable. As well as when I do something that I want to be acknowledged for, we're going to acknowledge you for that. And through the whole thing, we're going to love you up. So that's the predictability within both sides that kids need, need, and they respond well to over time. And then thinking holistically about responses for, for families. So wraparound services where we provide counseling to families, where we can get families in touch with social service agencies that can help them in other ways. We are one probably big part of, of, the, of the piece because we are the social institution that families turn to. We are, the schools are it. And so we are a big piece of that puzzle, but there's a lot of other services that we can help fill in. And, and that makes a difference for families as well, because ultimately we need to address those underlying causes as well. <coughs> so here's um, what we would propose for board presentations, but I would, would love your feedback on this as well. Um, David Fender is a, um, a person who runs our Office for Behavioral Learning, and it's a unique thing that Salem Kaiser has adopted in response to helping kids with emergent student needs. And so I think hearing from David about what we're doing and, and investments that you've made as a board and we've made as a district over time I think would be a good first start. And it also centralizes the discussion on the students because those are the most important ones that we have um, to centralize the discussion on. But then. Um, thinking about how does this uh, impact our staff and how can we support our staff as they're doing this hard, difficult work. It's hard physically, um, honestly it is hard physically, but it's really hard emotionally. So there's a, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street that we need to support them in both ways. Um, I'd also like to present to you a couple case studies around the districts of, of schools that are doing a really good job. And they're, they're working in situations with families that are in crisis at times and doing a good job. And so I'd like to present a couple case studies. Um, and then ultimately, we'll have a discussion about what are our next steps, the kind of what do we do with this information. Any questions? Director Hyan. I just want to say I really appreciate the information, and I look forward to getting uh, <laughs> the rest of the presentations because it, it's an issue I'm hearing about a lot from a lot of different places and I, I know it's a big problem. <coughs> You're right, Green. I think one of the things, uh, Craig, thanks, you know, the social emotional well-being <coughs> of our students and our staff is at a breaking point in some instances and I think one of the things we can do as next steps as a district and I mentioned it several months ago at a meeting is look at our budget and hopefully we can reallocate some resources within our budget for not only academic counselors, but our mental health counselors. We've had several incidents across this district of not only students 
but staff that I think we need to take a look at. And um, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I'm hoping we can budget some priorities into our budget for this upcoming year to address this issue because I don't wanna lose any more kids or any more staff. Yeah. Are there comments? <clears throat> One quick one. Sorry. Director Blasey. So you mentioned the uh, legislative um, group that was traveling across the state. Um, Christine and I had the opportunity to go and share, and, and it was just heartbreaking to hear over and over and over for, from the mid Willamette Valley area. But I did hear um, leadership from the legislative team that was out um, last week at the um, um, business summit again uh, because the governor presented her budget and as we all know you know she's um, looking for a huge increase in funds for K through 12 but the leadership from that team are planning to um, release their recommendations to the legislature later this week is my understanding um, because we have legislative days starting tomorrow and they're going to be making funding recommendations and of course they said that um, it's a huge ask, but I got the sense that legislative leadership is uh, making it a priority because like you said, what they heard over and over again and when they went into the schools and talked to elementary school students and middle school students, they're fearful of um, not having access to mental health. And the fact that a middle schooler knows to say, I need access to mental health and I don't have it, um, but they listened. I, I, I truly think the legislature listened and um, I know they're gonna have a big ask, but it is a priority. And so like Jim said, it needs to be a priority for us as well. I don't know if there's gonna be you know, a proposal or a legislative fix for um, behavioral health dollars or whatever it might be, but we can make it a priority. So I really, really appreciate this information because like Marty said, we're obviously hearing about this a lot in the impact so thank you for doing this work and for sharing it with us and could I comment on just one thing that you said that I think it's important um, this isn't a, just having money at the table with this issue we need to have a plan on how what we think is our theory of action to best use that money and a framework and and director green that's why we're trying to start this a little bit get this process started early because um, we we, we need to have what we think are action steps, how we're gonna measure the impact of that over time, and then to be able to move forward. So that's what we're hoping, those are the conversations we're hoping to have. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. And just to follow up to that, we did ask, Alice sent out um, an invite to our budget committee to be aware of these presentations so that they either um, have the agenda packet or they tune in and they get to hear these presentations so when we um, you know convene the budget committee that they're in the loop in all of, of all of this yeah. director Lipple. I would like to say that I, I really appreciate the comments from Blossie and Green I, um, directors Blossie and director Green um, I, I think it's a lot of very true statements I mean as much as I would love to uh, have the legislature pass something really good I, I don't like depending on them and so uh, I think there's a lot of actions that we could take. Um, I think you're right. I think setting, uh, making our own goals that are measurable um, so that way we can actually change something as well as putting our money where our mouth is. Um, I think if we do both of those, we can actually take steps because we can't lose any more kids um, and we're any staff for that matter as well. And so um, taking ownership over this, I think is going to be really important in the future. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, we're going to move into, uh, in your packet, I want to call attention to the fact that there's board, board and budget committee meeting schedules at the back if you're interested in partaking of those. Mm -hmm. And I want you to notice the January 8th board meeting has been rescheduled for January 15th. And the last one, boundary review task meeting schedule is also in the back of your packet. So we urge you to participate in all of those. Uh, we move into public comment next. And this section of public comment is for, um, for uh, those that, for items that are not on our regular budget. Uh, first one on our list is 
Janine, Shannon Johns. And I apologize that we're running later this That's evening, right. but thanks for holding on. I have most of a scarf done, so we're good. Um, uh, thank you for letting me come. The reason that I came tonight, it was a bonus that I got to talk about my oldest daughter who goes to Howard Street, but the reason I came tonight was to talk about what's happening in my younger daughter's class at Yoshikai. Um, my name is Shannon Johns, and I live at 4056 Marcus Court, Northeast Salem, Oregon, 97305. I forgot to do that last time. Um, Craig's presentation very much describes what's happening in my daughter's class. I would love to say that the biggest issue in her class is that there are 31 kids in her kindergarten class. That's not the biggest issue in her class. The biggest issue is that they are room clearing the class three to five times a week, sometimes multiple times a day for one student. One student who is terrorizing the rest of this class there is not a day that goes by that a student in the class is not hit, kicked, punched, scratched, or told, you cannot go into that area or do this activity because this student is having a situation where they're acting out. My, my husband and I, we believe in public school education. We support it. We send our children there on purpose. We live in an area of town on purpose, intentionally live in the Northeast area because we want our children to be exposed to that environment. But school should still be a safe place for students to go. I have a child that has gone to daycare with my daughter from when they were, from the time that they were babies. They were both super excited to head to kindergarten and the fact that they got placed in the same class was a bonus because they are best friends. But while my daughter gets it with kind of the splash out because she's a stronger personality and a stronger person and able to stand up to, the, to this child, her best friend is not. She no longer wants to go to school because she knows that she's gonna be assaulted every day. And that's not okay. That is not okay to have happen in our schools. And I know that it's a big problem, but I went to the teacher of my child's class at parent-teacher conferences. I understand kindergarten is a time where people are coming in. This is the first time sometimes that we've had interaction with these kids and we need to sort things out. So I was trying to give the school some time to deal with this issue, but when I went at um, Thanksgiving to talk to my parent, to, to my child's teacher at parent teacher conferences, and then escalated and went and talked to the principal. They said, because of the very policies that are in place, there's nothing they can do. There's, they cannot take action that this child needs. They have asked for services to come and make a evaluation of this child to put her in a place that would meet her needs and allow her to get education and to be safe and allow the other 30 kids in this class to actually have all of the school time that they um, need and that they need to be successful. I think that it's that this everyday 24 J is very important but my child is in school and is not having educational time because of this other child and her actions. So I'm, I'm asking for your help and where do I go to help Yoshikai address this issue? So thank you for your time. Thank you, I appreciate you coming and I realize that, that you have struggled with that. There is a problem and perhaps we can work on it. Yes? Thank you. Uh, next person, John, Jan, Mon Montez. Thank you. Hi. Wow, I might be the last person speaking tonight. My <laughs> name is Jan Montez, and I am. I live in Salem, um, kind of by North Salem High School, 13th and D Northeast, right across the street. And North Salem High School has about 
67% Spanish speaking kids there. It's incredible, it's awesome. But that's not why, what, the first reason I wanted to talk to you guys is because I tried to go onto the school district website and contact the school board individually and I found out that your emails aren't on there. And so then I found out that the only ways that I could contact each one of you individually was to go through the secretary or send a written letter or a phone call. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Perhaps I am seeing something differently. <laughs> I think I, I, I do a pretty good job um, on um, looking at websites, but I couldn't figure it out. Are you guys aware of that? That the public can't contact you individually by your web, by your no. emails? <laughs> so if you do send it in, it's to uh -huh. be sent to us, and we do get it. Individually, you can't, I could uh -huh. not locate your emails. They are not there, but I, I think. Why? The, yeah. Are they there? No. no. The, the pattern's there. Yeah, the pattern's yeah, part patterns there. there? Yeah. Okay, well, if I can't, as an educated woman, find that, maybe we need to work on that a little bit. But the reason I wanted to send you guys some emails, <laughs> because I have one more minute left, so I'm going to get to the point. Salem-Kaiser School District has about half and half Spanish-speaking students and English-speaking students. It's about half and half. Let's just say half and half, okay? I have a, a very strong background in um, the knowledge of why dual language is extremely important. And I wanted to go ahead and share some of my thoughts on that. Some of my background is that I, um, I was an educator uh, working with, with programs during the free trade agreement in Mexico and the United States. And I was a substitute teacher here in some of the dual language um, classrooms. But I think that it's important to note that second language skills um, can help us achieve higher proficiency in the second language than the traditional foreign language instruction and ultimately will help our students um, score better on the tests. So if I can please get those email addresses, I'd like to send this well-prepared letter to each of you individually. We'd and like I'd like to, to access it. that via the website if possible. Okay, thank you. We'd thank like you. to hear from you individually. Good. Thank, thank you. Um, Paul Crisell. Thank you. Um, Mindy Merritt. Of course, it just shifted off. Sorry about that. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Mindy Merritt, and I'm here tonight speaking as the president of Salem-Kaiser Education Association. I'm honored to have the opportunity, like you, to serve the educators, as an, to serve as an elected official. Um, I currently serve the educators and specialists to include our counselors, behavior specialists, school psychologists, speech and language pathologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and our autism specialists, and our licensed staff within Salem-Kaiser Education, uh, Salem-Kaiser school district. Our members are dedicated. Our members are proud. They're loyal. But I'm also here to tell you that we have members who are overwhelmed. We have members who are exhausted and schools that are not equipped with the resources needed to appropriately and responsibly handle the deep needs that our students and families are now in need of. And much like the parent just shared, Yoshikai is not the only one. One of the privileges of my job is to be able to go to the many different schools. And it is not um, unlike just Yoshikai. There are room clears throughout our school district at the elementary level. That is not an uncommon thing. 
There are um, class, there are meetings that are being held that we have specialists that are asking for additional supports and they're being told no, that the funding isn't there, that they need to look within their school for the additional um, thinking out of the box and looking for how they can solve it together. Um, we have schools that are in need, that are being told, I'm sorry, you just have to find a way. We need to recognize that the new systems placed to add the trauma our students are facing have added to an increased workload that goes beyond the contract day for many of our employees. Our high school counselors are often staying, especially right now we have one high school that is staying well beyond their contract day. As um, John Van Drill shared, the new um, SRAs, uh, the uh, suicide response, um, at the assessments that they're doing, they are taking anywhere from two at the least up to five hours per student. And um, that's taking anywhere from their full day up to if they have four or five students that mm -hmm. are thinking about it, it's going well beyond. So it's really important to recognize this is dominating our high school counselors, their time and taking away from the students that are at our high schools ability to work with their counselors as advisors. Talk to them about everyday high school needs. And I think it's really important for us to realize, Dr. Director Green, I appreciate your foresight and acknowledgement into the need for and care deeply for our students, their profession, and our community in recognizing we're going to be needing to budget for and talk about how we fund and support the social emotional needs for our students, especially in this upcoming year. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That brings us to the end of our public comment. Um, we move on to board activity report. And I'm gonna ask that each one of us kind of move on. One, one or whatever, Director Green. I'm okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Lippold. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a busy night. My whole brain just flogged up. Um, I'm, I'm sure I did a lot of things. Uh, I mentor a student out at Harriet. Now, Harriet, I was just out there today. That was a blast. We played some football with some kids. It was fun. Um, also went to the Boundary meeting at um, in Kaiser at Kennedy. Uh, that was a blast. There was, there was a lot of really good feedback from our community members. It was awesome being able to hear uh, their thoughts on the McKay slash West feeder systems. Um, so I heard, listened a lot about that. And yeah, it's been a good month. Thank you, Director Van. Real quick, uh, the Bond Oversight Committee, the first meeting uh, with Director Lippold was also in attendance. And then I know every uh, director here has been to at least one, if not two, boundary change meetings. That's true. Uh, <laughs> Director Blasi. I can't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about in the same, same shape. It's been busy. Yes. <laughs> Director Lee. I'll defer to uh, Superintendent Perry. We attended a very good uh, meeting at Waldo, and mm -hmm. maybe you can do a better job than me articulating what happened there. All right, so I'll, then I'll go quick. Uh, thank you to our, um, especially our Indian Ed PAC president, Yolanda Garcia, for the Native American celebration we had. Oh, oh. Yes, you did. Yeah, <laughs> several of you did. And I think we had over 300 people in attendance. And Chemeketa, awesome partner, wonders if we may have outgrown their spot. And then um, Four Corners is here tonight, so I'm just gonna mention, I got a chance to visit the Cubs Den at Four Corners, and Stephanie Taylor, their uh, behavior specialist, and Renee Gebauer, their embedded behavior cadre, got a chance to really showcase how they, are, how they do have those structures and supports in place for kids. And I got to watch a couple students who were last year would have been uh, two on one with an adult actually be successful in their classroom with very few times that they have to be removed from their classroom for sensory breaks. Um, so that's a great highlight. And then um, 
Waldo Middle School, the faith leaders went to Waldo Middle School. We're doing traveling around to different schools. And at Waldo, we got a chance to hear from our students in our newcomer center. And I'm gonna visit with board leadership a little bit. Um, Director Lee and I were talking about this. They would be a fabulous presentation to the board. And in part, the teacher can so artic is so articulate about their needs. And you can see such pride and growth in the students who have come from um, many, many horrific childhood experiences and are being successful in our, welcome, our newcomer center. So it was uh, pretty powerful um, just to hear the kids and hear the teacher out of that program. And it might be something for us to hear one night in the boardroom. And thank you for approving my contract. Um, I, this job, this work is hard, but uh, rewarding every day, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> In public, you heard that. Anything else? Director Lee? No. Okay. No. Director Kylo? Nothing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> superintendent's report? I did. Okay. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that brings us right down to adjournment, and I so much want to thank you. It's been a long night, and we got a lot of fried brains up here. So um, I appreciate you hanging in there with us.